And welcome into the Monday edition of Robbie and Rex Road here on ESPN 1025. The game, Robbie Stanley, Joe Rex Road, Ryan Porth here with you on this trade deadline edition of Robbie and Rex Road. We've got a lot to get to with the Nashville Predators today. We'll be joined at 8 o'clock by Corey Curtis from News 2. Darren McFarland from Darren Donica Chase drops by at 9 o'clock. Taking your thoughts on the Predators all show long here on our text line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com, 615-737-1025, 615-737-1025. Joe Rex Road, how in the world are you? How was your weekend? Doing fantastic. That's good. How about you? Oh, I'm doing fantastic as well. Good. Ryan Porth, how in the world are you? Doing great. That's good. You could have had a triple fantastic, but you It was you a fantastic weekend. weekend. You've already blown there it. You go. It's okay. Outside of Saturday night. But it was a fantastic weekend. Why was Saturday night not good? Porth? Well, you know what? There's a certain team above the, the border that uh, will not go named, and um, they are dead to me. So They've been some trouble out of them this year for you. Up in Ottawa. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and if trouble. anybody wants to know how I felt, you can just go back on my Twitter, Twitter. timeline. At fourth game. game. I was not happy Saturday night. So this is beyond weekend winners then. Oh, no. Yeah, this is well yeah, beyond yeah. weekend yeah. winners. So basically, well you just keep betting against the Ottawa Senators. Yes. <laughs> not a great Don't weekend. Don't count out the Sens, baby. Not a great weekend for me again in weekend winners. I, I had a bad weekend. One in five. One and five. Uh, it's back to back one and fives. Well, you know, not a good stretch. No, I didn't do well either. I think you probably had the best week, poor three and three. So okay, average week, below yeah. average. Yeah, I'm surprised. You know, now that I'm looking at the board here, I'm surprised we didn't do anything with the Masters for weekend winners. What could well, what we do have do? done like, though? Yeah. I don't know. Well, yeah, yeah I guess other you're than taking a deck than, Matsuyama or the field. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> over under on something. I don't know. I guess that would have had to have been independent. I guess I'm surprised maybe you guys didn't do anything independently. Yeah. You could have. Well, know. I had it in called shot. Yeah, I picked Jordan Speed to win. That didn't go well. Yeah, tough one. I didn't watch any of the Masters at all. I watched all of it. That's my the whole thing. The whole thing. Really. I woke up Saturday morning, put on ESPN Plus, the the you know featured groups that they had going on before CBS started. Oh, yeah. I was all about it. Wow. Well, congratulations. How about you? Did you split the difference? You watched some? No. No. Yeah. Well, I mean, I went to a restaurant. It was on. So yeah. does that count? No. Okay. Then no. I didn't watch I mean, any. If you were if you were actually kind of watching and yeah. paying attention. I was. All right. More than me. Okay, good. So that we've split the difference here on the program. <laughs> Congratulations to Hideki Matsuyama for winning the Masters. I did put a uh, a prop bet in there, the uh, the final tally. The prop bet at the time, I believe this was on Thursday, was the winning score being uh, minus 9 or worse or minus 10 or better. And I did the minus 9 or worse, and he won at minus 11. So, tough one. As He actually won at minus 10. Oh, did he? Yeah. Hey, don't mess with the golf expert. It's not what this says here. Yeah, it is what it says here. I can't read. Minus 10. Minus 10. He bogeyed 18. There you go. Still won. So, congratulations to him. And it was cool to see Augusta back. There's uh, some fans out there, too. And uh, It wasn't the same, though. No. It was not close to the same. Like, they, they showed, during a, a weather delay on Saturday, they showed the 2019 coverage. Yeah. And you're thinking, man, pre-pandemic with all those bodies all you know, bundled together. It's still weird on eighteen. Yeah, yeah, very weird. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the weirdest parts. Like going back and watching old sporting events. It's now weird to see all these people crowded together. Hopefully, we get to a place very soon where that's no longer weird. That'd be good. Joe, some other big news. We're going to get to the Preds hot and heavy coming up this hour. So continue to take your thoughts uh, on our text line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai dot com six one five seven three seven one zero two five. And we'll touch on this a little bit more out of the show. But this, to me, I mean, just totally came out of nowhere this weekend. Eddie George apparently getting into coaching and taking the job at Tennessee State. First off, what's your reaction to, I guess, Rod Reed being out at Tennessee State? And what do you think about Eddie George moving into the coaching ranks in college football? So, like I said, didn't watch the Masters at all. Did go to Top Golf, however with the family and uh got a text from a coworker Saturday about this 
as a strong possibility. And we were like, well, you know, they play tomorrow, so, you know, then, then you know, we'll see you know, see what we can find out. You know, they got a game tomorrow and all, all that stuff. And in the morning, McMurph, you know, Brett McMurphy <laughs> tweets that, and it's like, wow, that's, uh, that's awkward for Rod yeah, Reed. Yeah, it you is. You know, very awkward. So, like, the, the shock level wasn't there for me because I had a pretty strong idea it was coming. And apparently, I mean, Stillman tweeted yesterday, someone called his show and said it was happening. And then I saw some tweet from, like, a deputy mayor in Denver or something who a few days ago tweeted this was coming. I, I, so it's I a worst kept secret, apparently. It's not a very well kept secret. <laughs> yeah, but um, the mayor so, of Denver. <laughs> it was like it, it, not the not the mayor. I'll find it. it it's like a, some sort of official in Denver, Colorado. How in the yeah. world would he know? Well, he probably knows someone who knows Eddie George. Yeah. Or, okay. Know, right. Well sourced. So so this is a couple things with this. One is I'm assuming this leaked out on that side. Like there's no way TSU wanted this to happen like this. I would not think so. For this to come out like this uh, with – and then you're asking Rodri to go out there and coach. So on the one hand, I do feel for him, and I know later in the show we're going to have some sound from Rod Reed. Uh, that's, that's a pretty uh, brutal finish, you know, the way it went down. As for Eddie George at TSU, I'm fascinated. I mean – it's going to be – obviously, the first thing you think of is Deion Sanders and Jackson State, yeah. um, You know the, the former NFL star who really hasn't been in the coaching world who jumps into being a head coach. Um, and obviously, they, they play each other next fall in Memphis in the Southern Heritage Classic. So that uh, alone is going to be – like the interest in that iteration of that game is going to be, uh, you know, huge. But – I mean, I just like to me, it's uh, it's great for TSU. I think. I mean, I think in terms of you know, there's a lot of attention on it. You're talking about a guy. I mean, look, if anybody who followed Eddie George as a player, I would say he always projected the traits of someone who might be a heck of a coach, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, a very vocal leader. I guess my question would be, are you sure, Eddie? You know, because I mean, this is a very different kind of life you're signing up for here. That was my thing. Like, this makes all the sense in the world for TSU. I mean, it does. And, and look, I, I get it. He's not been a coach before, and that, that is a concern, obviously. But you, you talk about bringing attention to your program. I mean, this this makes a lot of sense for TSU. My question would be for Eddie George. I'm like, okay, are you sure that this is what you want to do? Obviously, we've seen Eddie George. He can do pretty much whatever he wants to do. I mean, he's been very successful both in his NFL career and in life away from football as well. So far be it for me to doubt Eddie George coming in and doing a good job. I think he can. I think he probably will come in and do a great job. But uh, I am fascinated to hear kind of his thoughts and his answer on why now, why this job in particular, and why all of a sudden the the, the urge to get into coaching, which as you said, Joe, when I mean, you talk about – a, a time commitment. This is a full time thing, a full time commitment that Eddie George is about to get invested in here. So I, I'm fascinated to see what his answer is to that. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the question. It's a similar question. You know, when like when Mike Vrabel came in here, it's like you really successful playing career. You know, most. I mean, most coaches go through the years of being a grad, the years of being mm-hmm. an analyst or whatever, and then you're a position coach. And you build your way up, and you're finally making the money. You know, you're finally up there making head coach money. Um, and so that was a question for Vrabel: like, why are you? Why do you want to do this stuff right now? It, it, well, he loves football, you know, but that's an NFL coach, right? So that's big money. And you know, you're talking about, I mean, for Vrabel, who probably as as a player isn't quite in Canton. You know, if Vrabel has a great NFL coaching career, he probably gets there, right? Anyway, so now you flip a Deddy George, it's a different kind of challenge. I mean, it's not an NFL team with all of the advantages, you know, of an NFL team. Um, it's going to be hard. I mean, it's a hard. It's going to be a hard job to win to get that program to the point where it's winning because there are other programs that you are competing with that have better financial situations, better facilities, et cetera, et cetera. And I also think Eddie George could be a dynamite fundraiser, yeah. not just a you know a coach, but an incredible, you know, face of the program too. So, I'm again from the TSU perspective. I think it's just terrific 
for him, yeah, I, w- looking very much looking forward to hearing from him because, like you said, I mean, he's involved in so many things. A lot of those things probably have to go way in the background now to to do this job and get it to the point where you're winning. And then kind of lost in the shuffle with all this yesterday, Jeff Fisher. He's back in the game, baby. An advisory role on Eddie George's staff, apparently. Yes. We talked about it at one point. It seemed like the Jeff Fisher would take any coaching job out there. Back in there with an advisory role. I'm interested to see what that looks like with Jeff Fisher at well, Tennessee State. So there's another part of this in the conversation on this. I had heard that he was involved, and I thought maybe involved in trying to get this as a head coaching job. Right. But apparently it's the advisory role. And give, uh, give credit, at least from me, from what I saw, Michael Gallagher from the Nashville Post. That's the first person I saw – um, tweet about this and tweeted that TSU is working to finalize Brandon Fisher's contract as D coordinator. So yep. Jeff Fisher's son as defense coordinator for Eddie George. So there's another quote, you know, like the staff for this. I mean, there's a lot of questions about this. I mean, it's, it's you know, it, it's again, it's not going to be easy at all. Um, but if he's all in on it, it could be really fun to watch. And I think it's going to be the most just – weekly daily attention on TSU football and how long I mean this is obviously a program with incredible tradition but it's been a long time since it had the kind of attention it's about to get it has Uh, also saw last night that Hugh Jackson might be the OC yeah yeah really you said that Uh, I saw that on pro football talk yeah that's interesting talk about putting together staff Hugh Jackson yeah Eddie George got the place buzzing around here Really cool news yesterday. I'm fascinated as this week continues here uh, to see what uh, what Eddie George has to say about this, uh, taking the job at TSU. So we'll have more to, t- to say on that uh, as it comes to later in the show. Taking your thoughts as well on our text line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. When we come back, we will get hot and heavy into the Nashville Predators. A big weekend for the Predators and a big day forthcoming today as well. All of that coming up next. This is Robbie and Rex Road. You're on ESPN 102.5 The Game.
Rupe hints his first shootout attempt of the year. Moves in through the left circle. And the save made by Saros. And the Predators win it. It goes down as a 3-2 victory as the Predators embrace goaltender UC Saros after this win over the Dallas Stars. Hey Ryan, obviously the results on the ice speak for themselves, but just from your vantage point, how much different is the vibe with this group now than it was, you know, three and a half, four weeks ago? We're vibing, probably. The Nashville Predators are vibing after a win last night against the Dallas Stars, 3-2 to two in the shootout. The Predators get it done, a huge win against the Stars last night. And now six points ahead of the Dallas Stars in the standing. Stars still with three games in hand on the Nashville Predators. Welcome back in. Robbie and Rex Road here on ESPN 102.5 The Game. A nice answer from Ryan Johansson last night in the press conference. You and Ryan vibing. Vibing together, man. That was good. It was a good answer from Ryan Johansson. And by the way, it was a good shootout shot. I did want to get your thoughts. What did you think of that? Changing it up a little bit. Now, I think he was still... He was coming in there, a little bit of speed, and then he hit the brakes. I thought he was going to slow it way down. But a little bit of a different move from Ryan Johansson last night in the shootout with uh, going with the straight shot instead of the, the deking and the dangling and all that all that mess. Yeah, I, I liked it. I appreciated it. And I said so um, on Twitter right when it happened, and then I'm trying to find this response. Uh which this person oh yeah todd m says too late you're officially a joey hater so yeah apparently hey not a joey hater <laughs> just a hater of the childlike shootout shots honestly I, like i hated uh yarn croak shot last night that's you your know? boy too i know it's the year of yarn croak and i'm like i just i like a little bit of speed pick a spot and fire and that's what joe hansen did he and did. he won he did he won the game so there you go. Do you think that he he switched it up in the shootout just because of you? He's like, you know what, Rex Road hates probably. this move. I do. I got to come in here and just fire one. I'm I'm guessing so. That's probably a fair guess. Right. Yeah. So, so as you heard him describe so eloquently there in the press conference, the Predators are vibing at the moment, and it was interesting because I, I knew going into this weekend we were going to learn a lot about the Predators, and I'm not saying that you base your entire decision on the deadline. At what happened this weekend. But it was going to be interesting. You've got Tampa coming in on Saturday, a really desperate Dallas Stars team on Sunday, and a Dallas Stars team that's been playing a little bit better as of late as well. Overall, I was pretty impressed with the Predators over the weekend. Obviously, you get the win yesterday, and of the two, that was the more important game just because of where the standings currently sit. I thought they played well against Tampa Bay. And I know you look at the score – and it's three to nothing, and you're like, okay, well, how well could they play when they don't score a goal? And you've got to get in there and you've got to finish. I thought Andre Vasilevsky on Saturday night made some huge saves in that game. I thought the Predators were the better team for the majority of that game. Now, Tampa Bay figured it out. They got their legs underneath them as it went on, and they played much better in the third than they did in the first period. But all in all, I think if you're a Predators fan and you were wanting to see if this team looks any different against a Tampa Bay – through one game, I mean, I think the answer is yes. I, I think they played pretty well in that game. I do, I do too. I absolutely do. Um, and like you said, Vasilevsky was great. You know, some some tough luck for them. They had a couple chances that just, you know, uh, you got to take advantage of those when you get them against those guys. But I thought they played really well. And then last night, I mean, I don't even know what they ended up with on the shot counter there, but I think they had like 13 with about six minutes left in the yeah. third. I mean, they were, you know, it was um, – you're watching a team that just does not have um, a lot of scoring punch, you know, but still scrapping and scrounging and finding a way, you know. Ellis flips one up there and Trennan flips one up there and um, really the one mistake was – just everyone decides to let Alexiak just kind of skate through right to the net. And, yeah, it looked and like tie, Bobby Orr. Yeah, and tie the game. Bobby Orr, by the way, one of you guys or somebody, and it was exactly right, like Yossi almost oh, told. Me, yeah. That was you, yeah. that Almost dunked one with 15 <laughs> seconds left to uh, to win that sucker. It was impressive. And you could tell, like, the last three or four minutes, it was almost like Yossi was like, all right, I'm going to shoot every single puck that I get. I mean, it was – it was impressive to watch, and he almost won it in regulation for the Predators there at the end. And you brought up Ryan Ellis. 
Good to see him back in the lineup. Makes an immediate impact. I thought he scored on Saturday, and then the play gets reviewed, and the puck was, you know, pretty significantly offside on that play. So that goal gets taken away. But he comes back last night, scores, and this one counts for the Predators against the Stars. I thought all things considered, when you factor in that he's missed 20 games, Ryan Ellis came back in pretty immediately, played well, and had an impact with this group. Yeah, well, they need him. I mean, it's it's amazing how many people they're missing and how many people they're missing and we don't really know when they're coming back yeah. and there's 13 games left. And uh, it, a lot of what they have right now, you have to be so impressed with how they're playing and you want to keep that together. But pretty quickly here, you need some more offensive – punch to to be thrown in and if you get that then I think you got a great chance here to to end up in the four but um in the meantime like the Trennan uh, you know Trennan last night so you know they do normally with the what the stars of the game they have everybody like fill it out normal times right we fill out the yeah star, everybody although I it. hardly ever do right do you normally fill yours out most time yeah, yeah I hardly ever do but so last night like I was asked to do it. Like, they're doing one person. Yeah. And I was like, Trennan's the, the – I don't care what happens this game. Tren- and I don't know what he ended up – what he ended up, second or third star. But I Trennan third, last yeah. night, just watching him, I mean, he's just destroying people all he over was. the ice. Just destroying – and, I mean, I mean, that line, like, that to me is, like, as important a line as, as you have. And I haven't even looked at the ice time, but they got a lot of it because, like, they set the tone – and I heard Hal Gill on the post game last night, and he's exactly right. Like that line, how valuable would they have been in that playoff series two years ago? Oh yeah, right. Like that, they just got pushed around by Dallas back then in that series. No doubt about it. They got pushed around, and you know those guys. And again, even like Genoa last night, just wrecking people. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, just that alone. Like you know, they're doing things. They have some things in place that give them a different dimension. Now, if you can retain all this and then Forsberg, Tolvanen, could be interesting. Yeah, it absolutely could be interesting. And to your point, I, I thought they answered the bell physically really well. And it's it's hard to overstate how important the game yesterday was. The response after you lose against Tampa Bay, you've got Dallas coming in there. They had just throttled Florida the day before. And if Dallas wins that game in regulation last night, all of a sudden – I mean, and I looked at the percentages. I don't have them right in front of me. But the swing in terms of that fourth playoff spot, I mean, it was massive if Dallas was going to win that game. And John Hines talked about the importance of the game, the the response the Predators showed, and kind of the approach that, that the Predators took heading into that game against the Stars yesterday. Here's what Predators head coach John Hines had to say last night after the game. We really focused on the on the competitiveness of the game. You know, it's it's uh, we're all aware of the standings and but it's it's the best time of year. And this is when, you know, the most competitive games got to bring out the most competitive men. And, you know, we talked about really enjoying the process. We knew it was going to come in. We have a lot of respect for Dallas. It's you know, they're a good team. They're they're a hard team to play against. They're really well coached. So we knew coming in that, you know, we talked about it this morning. It's going to be, uh, you know, Master Sunday and it was going to be a playoff type game for us and uh, just really proud of the way that the guys have readied themselves for the games and you know the commitment level the pushback in the games the physicality throughout the lineup you know we we do have some players that are playing you know big stronger guys that are very physical but I think when you look throughout our lineup doesn't matter the size or who the guy is the 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 competitiveness in the lineup is is making a big difference and that's how you win hockey games so that was Predators head coach John Hines after the game last night and I think to his point there, I mean, the physicality was a big part of it, but just kind of the moment itself, like, I mean, you've got a lot of young guys in there that have not played in some of these high-pressure games at the NHL level. And, look, it's one thing you go out Saturday night, you're playing the defending cup champs, and you play pretty well, and it just doesn't fall for you. I, I was interested to see kind of what the demeanor was after the game. The Predators were very positive after that game on Saturday night against Tampa Bay. And then yesterday, as I said, I mean, it's a massive game yesterday. If you lose that game, Dallas is going to be in the driver's seat in terms of the games in hand that they would have and the way they've been playing to maybe get that fourth spot. And you come out, you respond the way that they did. I thought they played well for the most part. And even when you know Dallas was controlling the play, the ability to hold on and the ability 
to not make the crucial mistake. Those were some attributes yesterday from the Predators that I was very impressed by. Like just the, the to handle the moment, to win the game, even when you're getting hemmed in your own zone, you're not giving up, you know, these grade A quality looks in your own zone. I thought they did a really good job of handling that pressure and responding to the loss on Saturday. Well, the penalty kill was huge yeah. last night and at times so there was a penalty kill in the third period where the second unit was caught out there for a long time. Oh yeah. That was exhausting to watch, but there was to your point, there was a <laughs> there was a star's possession in the offensive zone that I swear it took like 6 minutes. It was so uh, it was just cycling and cycling it's just they could not clear the puck. I mean, a so, couple of those guys out there for the Preds, and I don't remember who all was out Grandly there. Grandly looked like he needed an oxygen tank yeah, at like, the end of it. Just like, yeah. please get me out of here. And they, they hung in there. They hung, And, again, we still – I mean, we've gone this far without talking about Soros, who I, th- I think with him sometimes – I mean, people have said it, but I think he's so quick to react to some things that you don't realize how good some of the plays are that he makes because he – it was just really good last night. There, were, you did not have a bunch of highlight saves, and they didn't have like a ton of great A chances. But he stepped up big, you know, when they needed him for sure. And even on some of those plays where you just need a whistle, like glove that thing down and give us a whistle and get out of there. I, I thought he was really good in that area too. So a big response for the Nashville Predators yesterday, and now that leads us into a very interesting spot here today. With NHL trade deadline day finally upon us. We've talked about it a lot here on the show. Now that the picture is complete and it's no longer time for debate, it's time for decisions. What do the Predators do today? What should the Predators do today? We'll take your thoughts on our text line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com, 615-737-1025, 615-737-1025. We'll talk about that Coming up next, right now, though, got to tell you about my friends at FanDuel Sportsbook. And one of the things this time of the year that I love about betting on basketball is I'm always finding new player props or game props that I like. And what's cool about FanDuel Sportsbook is you can combine those props with other bets from the same game to score an even bigger payout. And it's called the same game parlay bet that you can only find on FanDuel. You can combine the money line, the point spread, the first basket score. They've got all sorts of options for you to combine. And if you haven't tried FanDuel Sportsbook yet, New users get a risk-free bet up to $1,000. Just place a bet and FanDuel will refund you up to $1,000 back in site credit if you don't win. And right now, new and existing users can get up to $25 in site credit back each day if your parlay falls one leg short with same-game parlay insurance. You heard that right. Every single day, that's one of the many reasons why I bet on FanDuel. So just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app today to try a same-game parlay and use promo code ROB at sign up. That promo code is Rob. You must be 21 or older and present in Tennessee. Refund issued is non-withdrawable site credit that expires in seven days. A max refund of $25. Terms apply. See sportsbook.fanduel.com for details. And for problem gambling support, call 1-800-889-9789.
Make sure you're tuning in later on on in the show as we reveal a keyword for you to text into the game line for your chance to win the T-Mobile Hockey Home Gate Giveaway, a Dos Equis prize pack including a case of beer, dessert from Nothing But Cakes, a T-Mobile prize pack, and food provided by 312 Pizza Company in Germantown. We'll have that opportunity coming up for you a little bit later here in the show. Welcome back in. Robbie and Rex Road here on ESPN 1025 The Game. Robbie Stanley, Joe Rex Road, Ryan Porth here with you on this trade deadline Monday here in the National Hockey League. And Joe, the day has finally come. We've been talking about this day for a long time and trying to figure out what the Predators should do. And now here we are. The Predators firmly entrenched in the fourth spot in the Central Division at this moment. They played well again over the weekend, losing one to Tampa Bay, winning yesterday against the Dallas Stars. And now it's decision time for David Poyle and the Nashville Predators. Now, some activity already underway in the trade deadline around the league. Nick Felino on the move from Columbus to Toronto. Taylor Hall late last night on the move from Buffalo to the Boston Bruins. So there has been some movement. What do you think about that one? Uh, it's it's difficult for me to get a read on Taylor Hall. It really is. Like I, he's really good. I think we all know that the talent's there. He's not been good this year. How much of that is Taylor Hall, and how much of that is the dumpster fire that is the Buffalo Sabers? It's probably a little bit of both, if I had to guess. But uh, I, I think Taylor Hall's a guy that's been on the uh, the Bruins' radar for a while. They've they've been looking for that left winger to come in, so he fills that role. I don't know how that's going to work out. And then, uh, I mean, Felino. you talk about Granlin. I mean, obviously he's the <clears throat> best asset that probably the Preds would be offering up. I mean, I'm assuming they're not trading at Cole. Maybe, maybe we're wrong. Not. But with Felino going to Toronto, that takes away a major potential suitor, huh? It does, and it's interesting, though, because we've talked about what the return could look like for Granlund if the Predators decided to trade him. Could you get back a second rounder for Granlund? If you did, would that be worth it if you're the Nashville Predators and David Poyle? And then you look at a guy like Felino, who, look, he's a really good player. He's got a lot of respect around this league. But he just he just got a first-round pick back for Columbus. David Savard, over the weekend, got traded from Columbus to the Tampa Bay Lightning through a three-way trade with with Detroit for very some confu- salary cap Very reasons. confusing trade. Yes, a very confusing trade. But he got back a first-round pick. So, like, if David Savard and Nick Foligno are getting back a first-round pick, is it that crazy to think that maybe Mikhail Granlin couldn't get you a first-round pick? Like, obviously it depends on the team. Well, yeah, who is the and, team? And, you know, Toronto's obviously made their move. I'd be surprised at this point if they're going to go out and make – any other moves like this, you go and get Felino, But, like, you're telling me Felino could get a first-round pick and Granlin can't? Like, I I think Granlin might be able to. Well, then, if that's the case, it's a, you have to do it. I, I've kind of I've kind of ruled that out. I've kind of looked at, like, in this pure speculation, reading tea leaves, but that, like, the second-round pick might be the best-case scenario. And I still think that's – worth doing but a first round pick how could you not if you're toronto why are you giving up a first round pick for for I, felino i don't know when potentially granlin could be available maybe maybe he's not maybe they've been told I no i know Does yeah. it, is that makes you this, wonder is that what this means that they said no sale we're closed for business i don't know i mean look you can't be closed for business if you're poil today right you gotta be you're taking you're calls. Oh, you're taking calls yeah. like you may not do anything but you're at least taking calls i, I doubt david poil said don't even yeah, call me. That's right. <laughs> no, yep, turn turn my phone off, everybody. Sorry. Yeah. So I mean that, that part of it is surprising. And look, Nick Felino is a good player, but he he's not the Nick Felino of 2014 where you're putting up 70 points. Like it's he, he's not that guy anymore. So it, it is fascinating to me. Like if you're David Poyle, what does that market look like for Greenland and or Halla right now? If the soft sell is still part of what you want to do moving forward here now. It was interesting. Like I tried to get a gauge last night on Twitter from some Predators fans after the game, and they're still all over the map. I mean, there's a lot of people that want to have a soft sell. April on Twitter, she says soft sell, get uh, a third or fourth round pick for Halla. She'd only trade Grayland for a first round pick. Would love to trade Richardson and Burrow, but both are injured, so those guys you're going to have to keep. So really, it feels like the conversation is between two people. 
it's Eric Halla and Mikhail Granlin. I mean, I guess maybe if the deal's right for Ekholm, maybe you entertain that if you're the Predators, but that feels far-fetched at this moment that that's going to happen today. Maybe we're wrong, but that just doesn't feel like it's going to happen today. But the, the reaction still kind of all over the map when it comes to exactly what the Predators should do today before the 2 p.m. deadline. Well, like April said here, I mean, if, if they get a third, I mean, a third or a fourth for Hala, I mean, I think you, you do that, right? You That's a good so. Hala for him. Jeez. Well done. It's a little early on a Monday for that, but we'll allow it. Uh, yeah, I, I was going to make a point, and I, your dad you just, joke, totally just derailed told, it. Yeah, just Sorry. threw me off. <laughs> I mean, that – because, again, you, like, you have – people coming back i think <laughs> to your we think so <laughs> we think so by the way during the break because we were talking about rem pitlick who i thought showed some good stuff this weekend yeah. I, I liked what i saw rem pitlick so he's got seven minutes of ice time one shift in the third so he's probably hurt too huh? i mean that would be my guess i mean maybe they just benched him in the third but one shift for a guy that i thought played pretty well all weekend long it, it would Stand to reason to me that he might be dealing with something. As tired as that team, yeah. I mean, they were hanging on, man. They yeah. were battling in the third. I wouldn't think that you'd be, you'd be just. But he didn't do anything to get benched. Like he played right. pretty well. It's not like he went out there and took a penalty. Yeah. So, so. so hey, we're just speculating, but yeah. But look, some people are coming back. I think, right? We hope. <laughs> I think so. I mean, because that's a, it's part of this too. I mean, like to me, Duchesne. In, is directly tied to Granlund. And maybe that's not exactly the right way to look at it, but I look at it like if you did move Granlund then, and DeShane can come back, then you put DeShane in that spot, which is was his spot before he got hurt, yep. and you go. And, and you know, you've got a, a very capable guy in that spot. If you're not getting him back anytime soon – I mean, look, you, ha- you I-, I totally get prioritizing making the playoffs. You absolutely should do that right now. You want to do whatever you can do to make the playoffs. It's just that if you have a chance to help your future, you can still do both, I, th- I think. Let's go to the text line driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. Nate texts in, says, I'd like to see players like Halla, Benning, and Bor- Borvietsky get traded. The thing is, it's kind of hard to do if the Preds don't have a partner, so I don't think they'll do anything. It's not like you can just move almost anyone this year. It is a different trade deadline, and it is kind of a more, I, I think, limited trade deadline in terms of what you could do. Like, I don't anticipate any defenseman being moved. Just me. I mean, maybe maybe I'm wrong, and maybe, maybe something big happens today. But with all the problems they've had on defense and all the different bodies they've had to turn in and out of there, I, I don't anticipate anybody being moved. And, you know, Borvieski's hurt, so he's, he's not going to get moved anywhere today anyway. But – it is interesting. Like you're looking at this right now. If you're David Poyle, this has become, I think, a, a very difficult decision, and I, I'm fascinated to see what they do. I said it in Call Your Shot Friday on Friday that I would still, I still would, I would do a soft sell to some degree, but my gut is telling me that this this deadline is going to come and go, and the Predators won't have done anything today. Do you still feel the same way that? Based on what you saw this weekend, it's likely the Predators stand pat. I mean, if I had, to, if I absolutely had to bet today on what they're going to do, I would probably bet stand pat. Uh, I but you know this is this is where like you're right. It's fascinating to see what they'll do. What we probably won't find out is exactly you know how what, close. Well, or, or even what exactly is being offered up. Right. I, one thing I just don't know is, uh, you know, like, like the texter said there, or tweeter said, um, who, who's, who's in, who's in on this? Who's, who's, uh, still interested. Vingan and I sat there on press row and did a back and forth, which is on the athletic today about this whole thing. And that's what one thing I asked him was like, who, who's the suitor. And he, of course he made a joke about La Violette, uh, getting in there. Maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe the Caps, huh? Yeah. David Poyle likes making deals with the Capitals. He does. Right? It's worked out okay He's for in, him. He has enjoyed that. But that's that's a big part of this, obviously, is like who is it who now uh, wants a Granlin, needs a Granlin, and, and would pay enough to make it worthwhile? 
It's a great question, and we're going to find out our answer. Trade deadline today at 2 o'clock Central Time here in the National Hockey League. And we want your thoughts on our text line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com, 615-737-1025, 615-737-1025. What will the Predators do today? What should the Predators do today as the trade deadline approaches by the hour? Coming up here on Robbie and Rex Road, and of course, we'll keep you monitored all show long on the happenings around the NHL as well. All that coming up, this is Robbie and Rex Road here on ESPN 102.5 The Game. One two five. The game is kicking off every weekend with free beer. Free beer, and who doesn't love free beer? Make sure you're tuning in all day on Friday for your chance to win a twenty five dollar gift card from Bavarian Beer House, located at Opry Mills Mall. Looking forward to that coming up on Friday. Ryan Porth has been on a roll lately with trivia questions, so we'll continue that tradition coming up this Friday here at nine forty five. Here on the program, welcome back in Robbie and Rex Road here on ESPN 1025 The Game. It's deadline day here in the NHL, 
And we are streaming live on Periscope, on YouTube, and on Twitch as well. Taking your thoughts all show long on our text line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com, 615-737-1025, 615-737-1025. And the question today is, what do you want to see the Predators do before today's 2 o'clock deadline in the NHL? And that is the poll question today at 1025 The Game on Twitter. Joe, the options are sell, stand pat, and buy. Right now, 45% say stand pat if you're the Nashville Predators. 42% say sell. 13% say the Predators should buy today at the trade deadline. Your reaction to the early returns of our poll question. Well, for the stand pat people, then I want to ask you, okay, what if... It's, I don't know, a first-round pick for Granlin. What if it's a second-round pick for Granlin? Like, is there a line, or are you just stand pat, period, don't care, want Granlin, uh, and that's that? A commenter on a, my piece with, with Vingan uh, got all mad because I said that Duchesne can do, you know, a lot of what Granlin can do. And a fair point that, you know, Granlin's – Granlin's doing everything. He's he's all over the ice. Like last night, he he made so many uh, plays at different parts of the ice. I mean, I mean, he's he's really doing a great job defensively. All that stuff. And the point made that Granlin is cheaper. That's fine. But again, you're probably losing him this summer. So yep. uh, so look like in my look. So this is Linda in my book. Granlin better than Deshane. Fine. But again, um. You can get something for him now. So I still think you have to keep the big picture in mind. As great of a story as this team has become, I just think you can have both things. Well, it's interesting to view the results so far. We're still very early in the voting here. But so far in the poll question, we asked a similar question, I don't know, a week and a half ago, right in the middle of this run that they're on right now. And sell was still the overwhelming majority of the response. I'm interested to see how this one shakes out, but it, I mean, it's obvious more fans are warming up to the idea of standing pat and doing nothing at the deadline this year and just letting it ride with the group they've got. Uh, I, you know, obviously when you win 12 of 15, things change pretty quickly with you, not only in the standings, but I think also with the mindset from the fan base around your team and just the overall. Um, morale of, of the franchise but I do remember when David Poyle and it's probably been three or four weeks now he went on uh, Darren Donick and Chase for his weekly visit Tuesdays at eleven fifteen, and talked about you know how he views this team the young guys and, and the role that they had been playing and you know not really laying his cards on the table from for what he's going to do at the trade deadline but there were some takeaways from that interview where fans were like oh, man, they're not going to do anything, and they're just going to stand pat. And there was, like, total panic on social media about that. I I wonder if that interview took place today, what the reaction would be, because my my initial reaction to that would be that it's a lot different with Predators fans right now. Yeah. uh, It's just, like, to me, and that's fine, I get it, but if you can, let's see. You haven't had Forsberg since March 25th. Last week, you lost Tolvanen. You lost Olivier. You lost Fabro. You haven't had Carrier this month. Um, then there's some other, you know, lesser injuries like Richardson, Borvieski, you know, but that's a lot of key players. So if you're missing all those guys and you're doing what you're doing right now, why can't you do things without Granlin? Is he the linchpin? Is he is is everything built around him? Well, and, provided some of those guys are coming back, yeah. Yes, no, that's true. I mean, Carrier. I'm sure, they, I'm sure they are. We've been told, maybe not that far away, but yeah. Well, like okay, so Olivier Carrier, they're they're long term. Yeah, I mean, they like if they if they get to the playoffs, you might see those guys again. But you know, I don't know. We'll ask Deshane Wednesday again. I mean, obviously he was doing well and then not so well. Yeah. But that could happen any time. Forsberg could happen any time. I mean, that, that's the, I mean, look, the week to week thing never a good. Those guys are all week to week to Shane Forsberg Tolvin. Uh But it's been one for Tolvin. It's been a few for Forsberg. It's been one for uh, 
Fabro, and it's been now five weeks for Duchesne. He was originally a three to five week guy, right? Yep. That's that is part of this equation, certainly. I mean, they, David Poyle has that information too. He has much more detailed information than the public has on exactly how guys are trending. So I guess if you're like, well, you're not getting these guys back anytime soon. So if you move Grandlin, I mean, you're already struggling to to generate chances. Maybe that's tough. I, and I get that. I do. I still would say, what's the price tag? What is someone offering? And look, they may go through today, nothing happens, and it may be that they just don't get any kind of solid offer. And then, yeah. and that's that's what David Poyle should then tell us that and tell us exactly what the offer was. And <laughs> then everyone cannot be mad at him. I, I just don't feel like the current state of the injuries is a reason to not trade somebody. Agreed. Like, if you have to go a week with somebody like Rem Pitlick playing out of position on the depth chart, fine. Tell them to join the club. They've been doing that for a while well, now. Well, like, are, are you really going to sacrifice an asset like a first or second round pick for that can help you for the next five to eight years because of two weeks of a injury bug? Well, but the – okay, I, I, I think we're all on the same page there, but the counter to that is, well – uh, it's been a rough go here financially, and it's a big deal to make the playoffs. It's a big deal this year. It's a big deal for next year. I've seen the season ticket stuff get tweeted out every half hour. And so it's really important to do that. And if you take out Granlin right now, and now that might all of a sudden – I'm not saying I agree with that, because I, but I'm saying that's the counter. There, sure. there is a counter to be made. Well, and also – how much value is there this year for that first or second round pick compared to a normal year because of the uncertainty around the NHL draft and the lack of scouting for these prospects? Then there's also yeah. there's also the question of, and we've talked about this, but how do you feel about Grandland and his feelings? Sure. In terms of re-signing, you know, I mean, is it possible that uh, that there's a long term deal to be made? He loves it here, likes it with the team. You have a good feeling for that, and so you'd rather ride it out and, and try to make that happen this summer. That's possible. I think that only happens, as you've pointed out, if somebody else is gone. The NHL.com has just put out their watch list, the trade deadline watch list, uh, as the 2 p.m. Central Time deadline approaches today. Granlund on that list for the Nashville Predators. Near the top of the list of defensemen, Matthias Ekholm on that list for the Nashville Predators as well. So I think the the vibe around here locally, we've talked a lot about vibes here today vibing. on the program. We are vibing here on Robbie and Rex Road. But the vibe I think locally here is the noise on Ekholm has calmed down and with the winning the Predators have done as of late and how, how important he's been to that winning, that that probably doesn't happen today. I still feel that way. I would at this point be surprised if Ekholm gets moved today. But it is interesting. He was the talk of the trade deadline for weeks when the Predators were going through their struggles. Maybe you find a team somewhere along the way today that looks at the moves that Tampa's made, looks at the moves that maybe Toronto has made, and says, God, we really need Matias Ekholm, and they just offer you a king's ransom. What do you do at that point if you're David Poyle? Well, maybe that happens. And I think you got to think real – hard about it I uh, from the start with that comb I think we agree like that's just a guy that that's a big big loss if you lose him yeah and it's a proven player and you know you don't know what's going to happen with a first round pick or even a prospect I, I'd want to see what the haul is Hawkeyes Preds guys says can we get an on-air apology for those that saw this coming two weeks ago two three weeks ago when Poyle said he was happy with the team he had no because it, it, it's not over yet so maybe tomorrow. At 2.03 today. And Actually, then, you got to leave some time for some like late moves to come in that are at the deadline. So at 3.32 today, a random time I've thrown out there, if they've done nothing, maybe we'll give you an apology. Maybe. Well, look, here's the thing, Hawkeyes Preds guy. You, you can say you saw it coming, but we don't know the conversations. I just my, – my thing then was, do we really expect Poyle to sit here and say, yeah, I'm about to trade a whole bunch of guys. You yeah. know, I mean – I. I just I didn't think that his comments were as 
indicative of what was going to happen as some people did. That may end up happening. It doesn't mean at that time he was resolved. I don't believe that at all, that he was resolved to not do anything. Today, I don't think right now at this moment, he 100% knows what's going to happen because he doesn't know what's going to come on the other end of that phone line. Sure. I mean, you don't know this stuff. And, and a lot of times, right by the deadline, is when some of the sweetest offers come in. Dave on Twitter says, offer Granlund a three-year deal. If he doesn't sign it, ship him out. He's not going to sign a three-year deal. This, I mean, you could if you're Granlund, you could get a long-term deal this offseason. He's not signing a three-year deal right now. So if that's your standard, I guess you'd have to ship him out. Because Granlin's not going to sign a three-year deal. How confident are you that he's going to get a long-term deal in the offseason? I mean, Flat cap, pretty, he stayed in the free agency pool for a long time? I'm pretty confident. Fair. You've got ESPN's money coming down the line. There's, the cap's going to be going up in the next few years. But I'm pretty confident. But it's going to be a few years, right? Yeah. I mean, the player, the owners are like – the owners have been shorted, right? I mean, the players have gotten more through all this. So, But, yeah. I kind of disagree with that. I don't think Granlin is going to get a three- or four-year deal in free agency. You think he's just going to keep signing one-year deals? I, if he's not being offered three- or four-year deals. Somebody will offer him a three- or four-year deal. Based on, So would, you're, you're basing that on just how he's looked this year? Yes. Yeah. Somebody will offer him a three- or four-year deal. I would be floored if they don't. But – but if I were him and his camp, I'd, I mean, I'd be kind of in between on this. I'd be not certain about it, you know. So, I'll, again, some of this is, like, your fit there. Well, with, with regardless, Hines. you're not making that decision now. Yeah. Like, yeah, if you're sure. grand, you're not no. signing right now. No. You're waiting to see what happens on that point. Right. Like, it, there's no way he's signing a three-year deal today. I mean, based on the way he's played and obviously how much better his play has been under Hines, if – one of the top two centers were to be elsewhere, then he would yeah. become a big priority, I think. Yeah, I, I think he would, but too. There's a lot of ifs. There's a lot of that. moving parts on that. We'll continue the discussion on the trade deadline, taking your thoughts all show long on our text line driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com, 615-737-1025, 615-737-1025. This is Robbie and Rex Road, live from the Wholesale Link Studios, powered by RumbleOn.com. You're on ESPN 1025, the game.
Welcome back in. Hour number two of Robbie and Rex Road here on ESPN 1025. The game, Robbie Stanley, Joe Rex Road, Ryan Porth here with you on this Monday morning in Nashville, Tennessee. Talking all things Nashville Predators. Taking your thoughts on our text line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com, 615-737-1025, 615-737-1025. The trade deadline in the National Hockey League is today at 2 p.m. Central Time. And David Poyle and the National Predators have got some decisions to make today, given the way the team has played as of late. What do you think they should do today? Taking your thoughts all show long at 615-737-1025. Corey Curtis from News 2 dropping by at 8 o'clock. Darren McFarland at 9 o'clock. We'll get into the Predators with them as well. Joe, let's go to the text line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. JD text in. Soft sell if the payday is worth it. Greenland seems to be a consistently good player since Hines has arrived. I would rather see the Predators move a slowing and often injured player like a Ryan Ellis. So we've talked about the discussion between Eckholm and Ryan Ellis. Good luck. And if the Predators would go about doing that, again, that, to me, that would be very unlikely to happen today. If that is a Ryan Ellis decision that ultimately gets made, but I do understand what JD's talking about there. Like, if you're the Predators and you see that contract for Ellis and know that there's still at least pretty good value for him just based on some of the things that you hear that the teams love Ryan Ellis, do you entertain that thought if you're David Poyle? Maybe not today. Maybe sometime in the off season. Like, I, I do wonder when it comes to the defensemen and the expansion draft coming up, you've got Fabro to worry about. Obviously, Yossi's going to be protected you got Ellis and Ekholm as well. Like this, the expansion draft, I think plays into de- into today to a certain degree as well. Like, how much does that factor into your asset management and what you do with some of these defensemen on the back end? I, I do wonder how big of a factor the expansion draft would be for David Poyle today. Yeah, I, well, I, right. I mean, I mean, it has to be. I mean, that has to be part of the whole picture. Has to be difficult too because yeah. you just. You can hope and you can think this may work or that may work. I don't know. Does he have friends close enough that, you know, they can have a off-the-record discussion right now about, you know, what may happen in the future? Maybe. I don't know. How how often does that happen? (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I would think some. Some. Maybe a little bit less on days like today. I don't know. Yeah. But that's – I mean, again, that's part of the – puzzle with Grandland too and the injuries now and the importance of making the playoffs now and then what you're offered there's so much that we don't know about the whole thing it's not as simple as you choose to do this or you choose to do that you know you made a mistake here you made the right call here you know all these factors that are part of it make it uh I would think a very interesting and challenging day to be a GM it is interesting. It is challenging. And it's also, I think, interesting to try to determine exactly what the market is right now. Like we've talked about Nick Felino was on the move from Columbus to Toronto, and Columbus got back a first round pick for that. And you get back a first round pick for David Savard as well. And then you're Buffalo and you're trading Taylor Hall, which in theory should be a bigger name than Nick Felino and David Savard. And Buffalo gets back a second round pick from the Bruins, and also Anders Bjork, who, I mean, he's a he's an NHL player, but, I mean, he's not he's got five points in 30 games this year. So, and you're also, if you're Buffalo, you gave up another player as well, Curtis Lazar, going back to Boston as well. So, you would think, like, if Nick Foligno is getting a first-round pick, why in the world is Taylor Hall not getting a first-round pick? Like, what is the market value for a Grandland or for a Halla? Slap in the face to Taylor Hall, huh? Could this be just Buffalo? Not knowing what they're doing? Could it also be <laughs> that teams just don't want Taylor Hall? That could be. Yeah, I would think so. I think if you're Taylor Hall today, you're feeling a little humbled, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, look. Probably been feeling that way for a while. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> All I can say is if, like, Ryan Hartman was worth a first-round pick a few years yeah. ago, I think Grand- I think Grandland is right now. Paul Gostad, Paul first-round Gostad, pick. Baby. Mike Santarelli and Cody Franzen. Yeah. There have been some doozies over the years. But as we went. We've talked about, though, I mean, each deadline is different. I mean, what a player was worth at one deadline is not necessarily what a player is worth at another deadline. I think we're finding that out here. But it is interesting just trying to determine exactly what the value is. Now, in Felino's case, I mean, you're talking about a guy 
who not only can play, I think, anywhere you want him to play, whether that's in the top six or on a third-line role or, any, or something like that if you're Toronto, but also what he brings to the table in terms of his leadership and the respect that he has. Like, I do think teams, maybe sometimes to a fault, put more emphasis on that and maybe pay a prior high, or a higher price for players like that when it comes to the deadline. And Felino, I mean, look, he's 33 years old. He's got 16 points in 42 games this year. Like, he's not going to come in and just light the world on fire for Toronto. But he is a guy that's done a lot of of leadership. I mean, he's been the captain in Columbus forever. He had 73 points back in 2015. He's been basically a 30-point guy the last few years. So I, there's value there, and he's the type of player that I think can help you in the playoffs. And believe me, Toronto's got enough skill. They don't. They don't need to worry about all that. Well, maybe. But, yeah, maybe they need more of that. More yeah. of the intangibles. But it is. It's interesting how a guy like that's valued at a first round pick, and then Taylor Hall, who, albeit, has not been good this year. But you know, I mean, he's former league MVP. You can't get a first round pick back for Taylor Hall. So yeah, that's it's odd to me. Yeah, yeah. So some. So the intangibles maybe aren't in his favor the way people look at, it, but also the injuries, right? Yep. That's part of it. But yeah, I mean, there's some. There are some moves and some prices that don't add up, and I mean, some of it may just come down to like bad GMing, you know. Yeah. Some of these teams, I mean, it's uh, it's 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 not linear. It doesn't totally all add up together. Let's go back to the text line driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. Ryan in Nashville text in a soft buy for the Predators. Get a few depth players to help with all the injuries. Oh gosh. So Ryan going the other way, saying, bring some people in. You trolling us, Ryan? You trolling right now? He's not alone. Go back to the poll question. 14% want the Predators to buy. Okay, what percentage of Twitter is trolls? I don't know, but I'm just telling you what the poll question says. 14%. At least 14%. Oh, in terms of the overall trolls? Oh, it's it's higher than that. So, you know. It's probably about (laughs) 50-50. I was about to say. It's higher than that. I mean, that could be all (laughs) bots voting right there. You know? That could be all bot voting. Can they do that? I can't believe. I don't know. I don't think bots can vote on Twitter. No? Uh, No. No. Well, they can they can uh, make fill uh, out one of those captures on the vote now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and get into arguments. Determine these three pictures <laughs> yes. that have a stop sign. We we should have that with our polls. We should have uh, prove that you're a human uh, aspect to it. I just can't believe anybody would seriously talk about buying right now. But he's not saying a big buy, a soft buy. Yeah, you bring okay. in some depth. I mean, they played. 1,000 defensemen this year. Maybe you need some help See, on the back end. You're trolling now. I am. You're trolling in, in real life. Yeah. No. <laughs> he might be He he might be just saying, you know, the seventh round pick for Jan Halavich back in yeah. 08. Oh, yeah. I remember that one. Yeah. <laughs> Do you? Yes. Halavich was actually pretty, pretty good for like shook, 20 games. That shook Former the game sports player. world. That shook the sports world top to bottom. Halavich made a great play in uh, in one of the playoff games against the Wings. Hibbs on Twitter says, I want them to buy just to see Joe have a breakdown. I'm with you, Hibbs. Do you, Hibbs? I think Predators should buy today. That- By the way, speaking of a Joe breakdown. Yeah, coming up at 745. Don't oversell it. We are excited for the debut of the Rex rant here on Robbie and Rex Road. You can catch that later this hour. Are you excited, Joe? Well, <laughs> yeah. The problem with the, the – I like the name. It's a good word play. Thank you. But it's, you know, I don't know that these are always going to be me screaming. I'll try. You don't have to scream all the time. Okay. Does a rant have to be a scream? No. You no. Can, you can be a calmly yeah. ranting? Okay. As long as it can be a calm rant, that's fine. That's fine. We can do that. I don't know if it'll be it. calm after you hear the music that leads you in. Okay, oh, yeah. We could wow. get you fired up a little okay. bit there. Hopefully it's some Steely Dan or Hall & Oates, man. <laughs> get me all – rocking on a monday i'm gonna go out and guess it's not gonna be either one of those two when we come back we'll continue the discussion on the nashville predators taking your thoughts on our text line driven by wilson county hyundai.com 615-737-1025 615-737-1025 and i've got an interesting theory about this predators team that we'll get to coming up next as well this is robbie and rex road here on espn 1025 the game
When the Preds have a weekday game this season, it's your chance to participate in Preds Pick to Click, brought to you by New Amsterdam Vodka. If you guess a Preds player that scores a goal in the game that night, you will win a prize pack. The next chance to participate is tomorrow morning at 8.45 here on the program. The Predators back in action against the Tampa Bay Lightning tomorrow. And the question now is, what will the roster look like tomorrow when the Predators take on the Tampa Bay Lightning? Will it look the same? Will there be no movement at the deadline? Will David Poyle and the Predators decide to make some moves, either via sell or in some cases, as some ideas have been thrown out there, maybe a buy or two today at the deadline as well? We'll have to see, Joe. What happens on that Why front? do the soft buy? Go hard buy. Big buy. Best buy. <laughs> Best buy. Best <laughs> buy. That's right. Go out. Go all out. Michael on Twitter says, make the moves. If you get in and lose in the first round, not trading any assets – is a bad move. Hard to think moving at least some pieces is going to make a huge difference with this group. Now it is. Look, I hear all that, and I hear that it's it hasn't made a difference to this point, regardless of how many injuries they've had. But are we kind of getting close to like the tipping point of they've got nine guys out of the lineup right now? Like if you remove Granlund and Halla from the mix, and no guys are coming back for another week, like doesn't that really kind of sabotage the group at some point? Like don't we have to reach the point where too many guys are out of the lineup, or well, could they just keep just keep chugging right along? Well, my see, like one of my answers to you right there would be, man, I like how Rem Pitlick played this week. Yeah, now he may be the the he like, be. that's weird that he barely played in the third period, <laughs> so he may be the next hurt guy. But uh, they do they have been able to keep bringing guys up and bringing guys in and getting pretty good hockey out of them. Th- this Except is, for Michael McCarron, but yeah, yeah, that was rough. That that was not good. Got uh, suspended two games over yes, the weekend. Yes, yes. Deservedly so. Why yeah. is he on an NHL roster again? Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, well, Let me not, just say, there was, a, there was a discernible difference between Michael McCarron and Tanner Janot yesterday. Pretty discernible. <laughs> He's yeah. pretty good. Tanner Janot had a couple hits last Ooh. night. My goodness. Um, look, you're not wrong. I mean, this is where, again, the information Poil has is superior to what we all have. Because week to week could mean a lot of things. So if week to week is a couple weeks and you're like, okay, you get to the point where you make these deals like you know you won't score goals, you know, for the foreseeable future, then I think you you have to really think long and hard about it. But here's the thing. There's people right now, Preds fans, who are saying stand pat or buy or whatever. And if they do just get swept out of the playoffs – they get wiped out in four or five games by Tampa Bay or Carolina. A lot of those people are going to go back and say, oh, how did we not sell anything at the deadline? Yeah. So make sure, put yourself, project yourself a month from now or six weeks from now, five weeks from now, whatever, and consider that scenario where great job getting the playoffs. You got knocked right the heck out. You're done, and you got nothing for these expiring contracts. Wait. But- Go ahead. That scenario, Joe, is also assuming that they make the playoffs. Yeah. I mean, there's there's no guarantee that they do make the playoffs. Schedule's about to get a little tougher. I mean, you've got Tampa. You've got Carolina coming up as well. Some more games against Florida. Like, I think I think there are seven games left, if I'm right. Seven against Tampa, Carolina, and Florida. And, and, we you, know, and they've won three times. Against against three in a row against Chicago, yeah. I think. And that's are massive. Massive, massive games. And obviously, you know, Chicago could – they're right there. Yeah. So, and I still think Dallas is a big. Last night's huge, but I'm not counting out Dallas. They got three games in hand, and they, and they didn't be, have Radulov last night. They didn't have Sagan. They could be getting, they could be getting Tyler Sagan back. I'm kind of surprised. He's skating. So, so, so that's a great point. Imagine that scenario. I'm I'm thinking of the get smoked in the first round scenario. Imagine the, all right, and then you don't make you know look gonna. Going to go for it, and then it goes the other way, and you don't make the playoffs. I Again, if you get a decent offer, I think you have to pull the trigger. But it is interesting, though. Like, do you, If you're Poyle, do you almost have to view this season so far in like as two separate seasons? Because the difference with this group, and maybe it's not the entire thing, but I think the people the, the thing people point to with this group is, all right, as soon as you started to bring up some of the young guys, and the young guys came in here, and it was more than just Holvin and coming in, there were multiple young guys because of injury coming in the lineup. 
that's when this thing turned around, and that's when there was a new in, in, uh, energy in there. I mean, Joe Hansen talked about it last night. These guys aren't just contributing. Like, they are a driving force in what's happening right now. So I almost feel like if you're Poil, like, do you view the season as two kind of separate entities all by themselves from this standpoint? Like, we all know what the conversation was a month ago. It was, all right, it was it was not a question of if they were going to be a seller at the deadline. It's like, how big of a seller are they going to be at the deadline? Like, Granlin and Hall are going to be gone. Richardson will be gone. Like, what is the return going to look like for Matias Ekholm? And it felt like a gigantic rebuild for this franchise might be necessary. It doesn't feel that way right now. Now, I'm not saying that they should leave everything alone and that they just let things continue the way they're going right now, that all of a sudden they're going to be a Stanley Cup contender in a year. But it doesn't feel like the total teardown that we were talking about a month ago is necessary anymore. Maybe some retooling. Maybe some bigger roles for some of these younger players that are coming in, but it doesn't feel like you're gonna you're in the middle of a five year process at this point, like it did a, you know this time a month and a half ago. Yeah, doesn't feel that way because you're red hot right now, and yes, it's two totally different seasons. It's a terrible season and a great season. Yeah, but it all adds up to okay. So let's say you just do a little bit of retooling. You coming back next year and you're a cup contender? I would doubt it, but who knows? I mean, look, there, there's some very encouraging things, especially Tolvin. And I, I, I mean, I love Trennan and Olivier and, and what that gives you as a backbone, you know, as a, you need a checking line like that. I mean, I, there's a lot to like about some of the young guys. We're going to find out about Tomasino. I mean, you could see where if this and this and this broke right, they could be good. And it still comes down to what's the most important position on the ice. And gosh, is this who he is now? I don't know. I mean, he, and I'm talking about UC Soros, and they are on this just crazy run together. Is that reality? Or is this just being on one for an extended period and there's going to be some regression? A lot of questions. There is. And this is an interesting point brought up as well by Greg on our text line, driven by WilsonCountyHunday.com. My question is, who do we sell to? Like, it appears to me all the teams that would be buyers have already made their deals. Is there even a market for the players right now? Like, you yeah. think about the Islanders have made a move. Pittsburgh makes a move last night, bringing in Jeff Carter from L.A. Washington's still out there. Now, maybe they can make a move, but Boston brings in Taylor Hall. Toronto brings in Nick Felino. I mean, you still got Colorado that hasn't really done anything yet. Vegas, if they're trying to catch Colorado and trying to compete – those two would be very interesting to me in terms of what they'd be willing to give up. But, I mean, Vegas, you're a team. Vegas, a couple times this year, hadn't been able to ice a full team on the ice because of salary cap problems. Like, they, they're up against it from a salary cap perspective, too. So, that's a great point brought up by Greg is, all right, is there is there people or teams that are out there that you could still sell to based on the market? I would tend to say yes. Like, I still think Colorado's an option. I still think Washington's an option. I'm not convinced that Pittsburgh is absolutely done yet at this point either, but uh, the options are limited, that's for sure. Vegas has lived the life of a like yeah. 20 years of a franchise's life in two years. Pretty yeah. amazing stuff. But it, it's a good question because obviously some of the, the, the teams we, we have talked about are now either they're fine or, or like Philly is just like falling. The, you know, there's like there's a lot of things that have happened. So it's a smaller group, but. I wouldn't say that there's zero chance of somebody making a call to Poyle today that he likes to hear. You think Granlund would go to Washington? You think the Caps would trade for uh, Mikhail Granlund? <laughs> La- Lavi's like it was all the on. success that Granlund yeah. had with Lavi. Uh, I would be. Uh, I would surprise me. He's like, come on. They, they, what if they did though? Granlund would be like, oh my god. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> well, the, I well, hopefully he's a Cobra Kai fan. Maybe so. <laughs> Lavi likes to put on the Cobra Kai gear. What do you think about Ryan Getzlaff? There's, I mean, he's been obviously a legend in Anaheim, one of the best players that's ever played for that franchise, and he's been there for a long time. That, Anaheim's not close. I mean, that team, Bad. they're in the middle of a rebuild. They're not good, and they're not going to be good anytime soon. And there are rumors that maybe Getzlaff could be on the move today. What do you think of that? Isn't Colorado looking for a center? Yep. Mm, that'd be interesting. Have Getzlaff as your third or fourth line yeah. center? 
If I was Colorado, I'd just play McKinnon like 33 minutes a game. But that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> so then the Preds, when they get back with Colorado next year, could hate them even more. Well, he's a free he's agent. He's a free agent. Oh, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Well, but they could still hate him anyway because they might be the cu- defending cup champs. That's by exactly. <laughs> They're pretty good as of late. You didn't mention Carolina. Yeah. Carolina, I would think, would want to get in into the mix at some point today. You would think. And wasn't Florida – did Florida clear all that money and they still haven't done anything? Yep, and that's a team to keep an eye on because they cleared some money over the weekend and it kind of feels like they're opening themselves up to maybe a bigger deal. Now – Maybe it was being in on Taylor Hall and they lost out on it. I don't know. But I would keep keep an eye on the Florida Panthers today. Joel so, Quinville doing some business down there. I would think Florida would want another top six forward. Yeah. Like they're a good team, but they've been making it work with some players that aren't really everyday top six forwards. Yeah, and you've also lost Eggblad right. too. Yeah. Right. So that loss makes it essential, probably. But those. So the more we talk about it, there's more options for the Predators. Well, yeah. first round pick. How, how much of a deterrent is it that for the Preds? I mean, it's not, I mean, it's, this is a one year anyway. So one year that th- that you're in the division, they're going to finish ahead of you. Right. So who cares, right? Right. You're not you're not catching them. Like you're not, yeah, catching, you're not catching Florida. Them anyway. You're not catching Carolina, Tampa Bay. So I get it. Like you would be hesitant as always to trade within your own division because I mean you could see them in the playoffs. But I, I don't think it's an absolute deal breaker. If you trade to Carolina or Florida, maybe that increases the chances you won't have to see Tampa Bay in the first round. See, you help one of them get the one, and then you play them. Maybe so. And but, then and then Granlin just lights you up. But something you got to live with go. at that point, I guess. When we come back, we will switch gears. Get back into. The story coming out yesterday of Eddie George taking the Tennessee State head coaching job. What do we think of that? What do we think of the way this whole thing was handled with Rod Reed as well? All that coming up next. This is Robbie and Rex Road. You're on ESPN 102.5 The Game.
Welcome back in. Robbie and Rex Road here on ESPN 1025 The Game. Robbie Stanley, Joe Rex Road, Ryan Porth here with you on this Monday morning in Nashville, Tennessee. Streaming live on Periscope, on YouTube, and on Twitch as well. Hope everybody is having a wonderful start to their Monday morning here in Nashville, Tennessee. We've got the debut of the Rex Rant coming up at 745. So looking forward to that coming up here in about 10 minutes or so. Right now, though, talking one of the other interesting stories of the weekend in the world of sports here locally, and that is apparently Eddie George is going to be the next football coach at Tennessee State. This coming out yesterday, and Joe, you talked about to begin the show, you kind of heard some rumblings about this on Saturday, and it being announced yesterday, Brett McMurphy reporting it, that Eddie George is going to become the new head football coach at Tennessee State. Now, obviously, Eddie George is a gigantic name here in Nashville, a star player with the Titans. I think he made four straight Pro Bowls from 97 to 2000. And between he and McNair, I mean, those were the two faces of the franchise back in the glory days of the Titans in their run to the Super Bowl. And he has been successful in pretty much everything that he's done since then. So Eddie George, a very popular figure, one of the most popular athletes in the history of this city, I was surprised that he went the route of coaching, although I guess the more I think about it and the more I think about his personality, the less surprised that I become when when thinking about this discussion. But uh, Tennessee State, an interesting place to start this off if you're Eddie George. What do you think of all this, Joe Rexrode, that, that Eddie George now becoming the new head football coach at Tennessee State? Well, I, I, will, I will start with, the way it went down, which I don't believe at all, is how Tennessee State wanted it to go down. Um, and I, you know, like I, I doubt Eddie George wanted to go down this way either, but it got out. Oh, yeah. And McMurphy reported it, and so you get this awkward situation with Rod Reed, you know, coaching this game, and of course then he uh, has to answer questions about it afterward. I mean, it's, it's especially from the TSU perspective, that's this is not how you want it to go. Um, but the the thing that most people immediately talk about is, holy cow, Eddie George is going to be TSU's yeah. football coach, and it's going to be. I mean, I think it's big for TSU. I mean, it's it's going to mean more attention and focus on this program than it's had in a long time. You're talking about a program with incredible history and tradition. Um, it's been okay. You know, it's been decent over the years. I think that, you know, in terms of comparing TSU football to competitors that does not have the facilities the funding that some do, um, the attention, you know, just like a lot of things that I think in Nashville, it's like, we talk about full crowds at Memorial or like the Belmont Lipscomb games that used to, you know, you, know, you got pro sports here. Now you got a lot of things that that take away from some of these um, sports teams that used to get more attention. But this is going to bring a lot of attention to TSU. Uh, the Eddie George perspective is really interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it's interesting that he's signing up for this kind of uh, a job. It's a tough one. It's going to be a very hard job. But I think he's absolutely a head coach-like personality. Like, if he would have gone right into coaching after playing, that wouldn't have been – the only surprise is usually when you – have a successful career like he had or like Mike Vrabel had, you don't expect guys like that to go into coaching because it's exhaustive. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's most people that get to those jobs have built their way up through all those years of being a grad and being a position coach and all that stuff. And like, do you want to get into that? So it's going to be interesting to see what he says about that, but uh, Hey, we're going to be talking about TSU football in the, in the foreseeable future, way more than we were. That's for sure, and Rod Reed now apparently on the way out at Tennessee State, compiling a 60-69 and 69 record. He's been there since 2010, and Rod Reed talked about yesterday, and you mentioned you know uh, an awkward situation for Tennessee State and Rod Reed. Rod Reed talked about his tenure yesterday at TSU. Here's what TSU head coach Rod Reed had to say. It's been ups and downs. I think that you know those years uh... – uh, I, I think we did a great job of building the program. It was just hard to sustain it. You know, we ran into some financial deals, uh, you know, after the 2013, probably in 2014, 2015, you know, there was some budget cuts. You know, we we haven't had our kids in summer school for the last five years. You know, we haven't really had a recruiting budget uh, in the last four or five years. Uh, we've played with 
uh, seven less scholarships. We hadn't had a full 63 scholarships uh, up and this was the first year that we had 63. You know, when Dr. Allen got here and he saw that we did not have 63, we were able to provide 63 scholarships this year, you know, with the guys that we got coming in. So we've been playing, you know, with a, with a one handed, so to speak a little bit, but again, our job is to get them ready to play regardless of the circumstances. My dad always told me and uh, coach Gillum always told me, Hey, you got to play the hand that's dealt you. And that's the hand that's been dealt us. It was a tough hand. And a lot of the fans and people don't know, you know, what we were dealing with, with lack of recruiting budget, uh, not having summer school, which is so very important uh, in this day and age. But, you know, uh, all they expect you to do is go out there and win. And that's the bottom line. And, you know, for the last three years, we hadn't gotten that done. So, uh, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, you know, we can get this thing back going in the right direction. And, you know, Big Blue will be back on top again. So that was Rod Reed. Uh, first off, very classy in, in the way he handled that. But kind of laying out the challenges that they've had to go through there at TSU and all the different financial pitfalls that they've fallen into and the lack of a recruiting budget, all these things that Rod Reed threw out there on the table I think that kind of highlights the job that Eddie George is walking into and the challenge that he now faces. Now, in terms of fundraising and bringing excitement to the program, I'm not sure you could have picked anybody if you're TSU that could do a better job in those aspects than I think Eddie George can do coming into this. Right. I mean, Eddie George, as we'll see, you know, as a coach, I mean, as a player, he was very much like a – he was a leader. He was a sure. vocal guy. He, he had the personality. Still different to be a head coach, be a CEO, hire a staff, all that stuff. As a face of the program slash fundraiser, things like that, man, I mean, talk about hitting the jackpot, right? Yeah. You know, Eddie George just automatically brings some cachet and, and some attention and uh, uh, name and face recognition. I mean, you know, he's – He's got a chance to really do big things in that way. And, yeah, of course you think about Deion Sanders at Jackson State. Now, Deion Sanders is a Hall of Famer. Um, it seems like he's done all right. I was actually watching some of their game the other day. Yeah. They were all right. They came back and won. Has anybody come in the locker room and taking any of his stuff recently? As far as I know, <laughs> they, they got stuff padlocked. So, <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so they're okay in that regard, yeah. But so so Deion and, and Eddie are, are – I mean, that's a – that's the Southern Heritage Classic, yeah. uh, I believe, in Memphis next year. I mean, there's going to be a lot of attention on that game. So, um, like, from the TSU perspective, it's – I mean, you could say, well, are you sure you don't want someone who's been a coordinator and has been a co- – but, I mean, I think that the big picture of everything, it's a, it's a home run. The Eddie George – why Eddie George at this time – with all the other stuff, I mean, everything he does, he's successful at. It's probably, I guess, is this bad for like Music City baseball? Like Eddie, Eddie's going to be coaching TSU <laughs> now, yeah. But I mean, you know, he, kind of feel like he's got his name. At, yeah. yeah, he's got his name attached. To that. But I mean, he does everything. He's successful at everything. Um, I as, would think some of those things would have to take a little back seat. As long as we still get the pump up videos from him for Titans game days. Oh yeah, that's got to be a part of the package. Yeah. Anytime Eddie George records a video or a speech, I'm all for it. Inject it in my veins. Like going back to for those who weren't here when Eddie George played, like go to YouTube and look up some of these NFL films season ending videos where they've got him mic'd up on the sideline and he's doing a pregame speech. Like I, I look, I think a lot of pregame speeches are the dumbest things on the earth. And like watching Drew Brees do some of that stuff sometimes was painful to watch for my soul because it was very awkward. But Eddie George, it was pretty awesome. Like, he, it makes you want to run through a wall. And he don't even play for the team. So that's pretty good. Yeah, the Newt Rockney speech, there, it's a very – really, you can't go there much. No. You know? But I can imagine – A lot of it end up like James Winston where you're just like, huh, okay. Eating W's, huh? Cool. Yeah. I mean, it's – you got to pick your spots. But when he does one, man, I, he'll, he'll grab the attention of the room, won't he? Oh, yeah. That is for sure. I mean, all eyes will be on Eddie George, and he will command an instant respect. So, I, look, I, I'm fascinated to see how he's going to handle this, what this is going to look like, and what kind of attention this could bring for TSU as well. So, Eddie George now stepping into the college coaching ranks here locally at TSU. When we come back, it is time for the debut edition of of the Rex Rant. Our Joe Rex Road is fired up. We'll get to that coming up next. This is Robbie and Rex Road here on ESPN 1025 The Game.
The time is now for the Rex Rant. Sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. On Robbie and Rex Road, here on ESPN, 1025 The Game and the Game Nashville app. Can you take me Oh yeah, baby. It's time for the inaugural edition of the Rex Rant here on Robbie and Rex Road. Got a little creed bringing us back into the program here. Doesn't that just set the mood perfectly, Joe? God, I'm fired up now. Way to go, Pork. What a great song. Did you know it was going to be Creed? No. But give me some Creed all day. I think we should do Creed every single segment coming back in one show. It'd be you awesome. can see poor sm- Scott evil Stapp's smile. beautiful face. Is he, is he from Nashville in, by the way? Scott, Scott Stapp? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, half of... God, I hope so. Because if he is, Yeah, and I hope he's listening because I hate Creed <laughs> so much. So, so much. That song is... Oh, man. Can you take me higher? That's pretty close. That so pretty good. Bad. Sorry, Scott. You're being. You have sucks. the voice of an angel there, Joe. <laughs> yeah, <you do. laughs> so that's a good. That's a good. So the idea is uh, uh, the Rex rant. Yes. Who came up with that? Uh, yours I truly. You, I think we that have. was you. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, me complaining on a Monday morning. Yes. And there's. I mean, I always have plenty of things to complain about. You do. <laughs> so now, but I. Yeah, you know, we'll, we can just we can play around with this. You know, sure. if you want to keep playing Blink One Eighty Two and Creed and. Bush, you can really get me angry, but you know I certainly want you guys to contribute. Okay. So, but this is this is today. This is this is my question, and and I think it's timely. Now, I said I didn't watch the Masters um, this weekend. Uh, you know, basically mostly watched hockey, but one thing I certainly did not watch, but but it was apparently a huge deal. Was, was WrestleMania? I don't even know what WrestleMania was. I don't care. But my question today is, why do some adults, and I mean some uh, quite a few adults, adults I know, treat wrestling, pro wrestling, like it's actual sports? Okay. Oh, boy. You're about to go down a rabbit hole That's here. great. That's great. <laughs> listen, hey, listen. I loved wrestling. I loved wrestling as a kid. Hulk Hogan, uh, Randy Macho Man Savage. I mean, George the Animal Steel, yeah. former uh, English teacher in Detroit. I got to see him live at the Kellogg Center in Battle Creek, Michigan, not far from Climax, Michigan. Oh, great town. Okay. Uh, I got a Leapin' Lanny Poffo signed Frisbee that night. I got to see the Jumping Bomb. You guys ever heard of the Jumping Bomb Angels? Uh, no. Incredible. There were two Japanese it women. Incredible. There were two, two Japanese women. There were fl- like, like eight flips in the air, okay? Okay. It was amazing. And still, as a. As a like a middle schooler, I knew it was fake, but it was fun. It was entertaining, right? It was like it's a fun night, and it's fun to watch on TV. Okay, the person has all that stuff's great, but like if you and I think Twitter has made this worse. So like last night, Chris Vanini, gr- friend of mine, great college football reporter for the Athletic. If you go to his timeline yesterday, it was the Super Bowl. Okay, and he so he's got a tweet. Roman Reigns has officially reached God status because like, apparently Roman Reigns won his match. Okay, well it's because the script said he was going to reach God status. Okay, our buddy Rick Merritt. Okay, R- Richter scale. Uh, he's tweeting like Sheamus is the new uh, Nashville's own. Okay, it's good for him, Nashville guy. To get into this, you have to be a heck of an athlete. But again. You won because the organization decided you were going to win. Vingan would have had a bunch of tweets about this last night. But he had a job But he, he had to cover the Preds. I went and looked at his – I was going to call him out, but he he actually was doing his job. Good, so, good job, Vingan. Okay, so you know what's more of a sport than pro wrestling? What's that? The Bachelor. Oh. Do you know what's more of a sport than pro wrestling? Dancing with the Stars. Oh. You know what's more of a sport than pro wrestling? Big Brother. And I, I watch Big Brother, and I am proud to watch it instead of pro wrestling. Wow. Okay. You know what's more of a sport? Uh, and when I was a kid, we played on Trapper Keepers. We, we would fold up our paper in these little keepers. triangles, and we'd like play football. you try to get paper it on the football? edge. Yeah. yeah. And then you'd try to kick oh, the yeah, field buddy. goals. Um, Great sport. Atari Pac-Man. Recreational children's badminton. Ring around the rosy. <laughs> Red Rover, Red Rover, send Robbie right over is more of a sport than pro wrestling. Wow, you're going to get people fired up. I love that. So, look, they're great athletes. They are fantastic sure. athletes. Again, the Jumping Bomb Angels, man, people should – I got to look them up on YouTube. They were unbelievable. I'm thinking now of the clip of the guy standing in the crowd and – I just love what you do with your bodies. It's still real to me. You remember that clip? Oh, no. <laughs> you've got to see it. I've got to find it on YouTube. Or I just sent it to you on YouTube. But there's some great stuff, like the great personalities. It's fun, 
But let's like we, we I, I think some people could actually get confused still and think that like they're actually competing. Like that they, they these aren't pre scripted decisions about what will happen on the mat. Oh, I can't wait for this phone call. Let's go to our 1025 The Game phone line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com, and bring in our good friend, the ultimate predator that wants Rexy. to weigh in. Uh-oh. Ulti, what's going on, my friend? Rexy. I <laughs> thought we were friends, man. I thought we were friends. We are friends. Are we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to lay it out straight. Listen, yes. Is it predetermined? Yes. Yes, it's predetermined. But listen... You don't go in watching this knowing who's going to go over. You don't know. Now, people can predict and people can say, oh, I can see where the storyline's going. But we don't go into this as wrestling fans thinking Sheamus is actually out there beating the crap out of the guy next to him in the, in the ring, which in this case was uh, Matt Riddle. Um, we don't, none of us really go into it thinking it's a competition. It's fun. It's good to let go of reality for a little bit. And and just enjoy the show. You don't go into the uh, uh, into the into the Marvel Cinematic Universe and think Chris Evans is really throwing a shield at Tobey Maguire and, and Captain America. It's 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 fantasy. It's 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 an escapism, and it's with uh, men and women who sometimes quite literally can put their their careers, their lives on the line, and can get seriously injured for our enjoyment. It's it's purely in in uh, an escape. Ulti, it's would you escape. describe Rex Road as a hater of fun? I I well, man, that might be a little heavy. Okay, I'm just checking. But definitely a hater of professional wrestling. Jumping bomb angels, Macho Man, that's great. Get put down the uh, I think this is real competition hat for one night and just get sucked into the fantasy of it, the escapism of it. Some yeah. of these characters are some of these characters are really really good and and. Yes, it's scripted, but you can't script gravity, and some of these people are really getting hurt. So uh, just enjoy it for what it is. It's two people having an athletic show. It's a show, an athletic show. It's not an athletic competition. It's an athletic show. I, you know, and, Great points. All great points. And there you go. So maybe we're still friends. Well, I think, oh, yeah, I think, I think we're still Thank friends. So here, <laughs> I, it's, it's funny, too, because I actually I was going to bring up Marvel movies because I love them. Sure. And it, and it's it's I I think of that comparison like it's incredible to watch. I mean, we know who's going to win in the end, right? Now you know you may you may lose someone along the way. Like the last one was was an amazing movie, but I like that's the point. But here's the thing. I think my biggest problem Spoiler here. <laughs> my, yes. Well, I didn't say who. I know. <laughs> I mean, if you haven't seen this movie, man, come on. That's your fault. Yeah, your fourth right. probably hasn't. But uh, so that's my. I think my problem here is again like sports writers in, in particular. Oh, it's Again, a big thing. Like Ving, like Vanini, oh, yeah. like I love you guys. Okay, They're, so I'm just calling out my friends here. Like that's, I agree. In fact, I'd go, I'd go check it out, as long as it didn't cost much. Uh, <laughs> What's the most you would pay? I mean, honestly, like if I'd go, uh, I'd pay like seventy five bucks. Would you really? Maybe 50, okay. 50 like for one night. It'd be fun, I'm sure. Okay. Because I know that there are tremendous athletes and it's a show. It's when we get to this, like, treating it like, oh, my God, what an incredible win for whoever. Yeah. Yeah. No. What are you doing? Like, your normal job is, like, covering hockey or football or whatever, which is – and now it's like you're putting it on the exact same level. That, like, you need to have a disclaimer. I've got to admit, I've never watched one second of professional wrestling. Not one time. Ever. In your entire life. My entire life. Never watched it. Even when, in my day growing up, it was the WWF, not the WWE. Yeah. And I ne- Stone Cold Steve Austin never watched it ever. Maybe I missed out. Maybe I'm on the brink of a discovery here, and that you've opened my eyes here. Porth, where do you come down on this? I think when I was like seven years old, I watched it and then realized it's all fake and predetermined, and said no thanks. Yeah. So listen, and that's the thing. Like, I hear what like Ultimate Predator and all these adults who follow it. They like they understand that. I know that they get it. I just don't feel like it should be like delivered as competition and it is let's go to the text line driven by wilson county hyundai.com paul text in truer words have never been spoken on the morning show thank you joe you're the hero we all need right now wow i expected some some anger here. oh there's some okay good let's go back to the text line driven by wilson county hyundai.com got a texture that says 
Thank you, Joe. It's so annoying seeing the official Sports Center Twitter account posting about WrestleMania as if it's actual sports highlights. You've hit on the nerve for some people here. I didn't even realize that. Now I'm even more angry. Are you serious? Yeah, apparently so. Greg on the text line says that Joe has just made the list with one Chase McCabe. Chase is going to be upset with you. Let's go. Let's go. See, this is good. We could have some, you know, we, we always uh, argue with Jared. You think you could wrestle Chase? <laughs> Set you up for that. Well, I mean, if it if it were pro wrestling, then whoever yeah. the script writer is, will just maybe I'll get smoked. Hibbs on Twitter says, "I really hope no kids are listening this morning." And Rex Road is over there ruining their wrestling hopes and dreams. Why? I just said Why? I said. We can't be honest with our children. <laughs> we're not about we're, we're going to let show. our children live a lie. Oh, that has been an amazing debut edition of the Rex Rant here on Robbie and Rex Road. You I can th- catch it. Every week, every Monday at 7.45. I just have been laughing at the visual of Chase in a wrestling ring against Joe. Like, if Chase Chase going to wear one of those onesies. That, quite, uh, if, yeah. if he climbed up <laughs> on the rope to, to try to come off the top rope, would he, like, fall on his face? Well, he'd come off. Yeah, it wouldn't be his plan. I, I don't think he would land on Joe. I think the, he'd the land on his face. would not go well. I can wear a unitar, right? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> Please put that visual in my head. What an edition of the Rex Rant here on Robin Rex Road, begun by Creed, and Rex Road finished it off with his assault against professional wrestling. When we come back, Corey Curtis from News 2 will join us. We'll get into the Nashville Predators with him. All that coming up next. This is Robin Rex Road, live from the Wholesale Link Studios, powered by RumbleOn.com. You're on ESPN 1025, the game. I mean, I almost said...
Welcome back in. Hour number three of Robbie and Rex Road here on ESPN 1025 The Game. Robbie Stanley, Joe Rex Road, Ryan Porth there with you on this Monday morning in Nashville, Tennessee. And it is that time of the week we go to our 1025 The Game phone line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com, and welcome in our good friend Corey Curtis from News 2. Corey, what's going on, my friend? How we doing? Oh, just counting down the minutes till we can stop asking if David Poyle is going to make a trade. Well, let me ask you right now, is David Poyle going to make a trade today? <laughs> I, you know, if he does, I think it's really minor. Um, I, I don't, I don't think he's, you know, he's been very loyal to a lot of his players in the past, and you know, he stuck by these guys a little bit longer than most of us would have, and said he wanted to see more. He wanted to see more, and and they rewarded him. And I can't see him messing with them because we're beyond the point of saying. They're hot right now. They're not hot right now. This is just the way they play now. Their goalie's red hot, but as a team, this is the way they play now. This is who they are. And so I don't see, um, I don't see how you can, you can, with a straight face, tinker with it. Hmm. I think with a straight face I say, well, it's been a heck of a, a run here. I, I hear what you're saying. You're right. This is not just – I mean, they've overcome a lot of stuff. They're playing. This is how they play. But I think the what you say is this is still not a cup contender, and if I we're agree going to, with that, go ahead. No, I, but, I agree with that. But there's no but. No, no, I, 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 I agree. <laughs> All right, thank you, Corey. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, I agree. They're not a cup. They're not necessarily a cup contender. But in 2000, what was it, 17, did we think that team was a cup contender? No, we did not. We thought they were going to be one and done in the playoffs. You just don't know. The L.A. Kings got in on the last day and went all the way to the cup. So, so you just don't know. And there are a lot of teams, mainly in Canada, who would love to get to the playoffs every year. And I don't think that you can um, – you can cast that aside. I don't think you can – if you were to tinker with this team and then they missed the playoffs, um, you know, if it fell apart after you did it, that, that would be tough to live down. And, and, look, I'd love to get a second-round pick or a first-round pick for Mikhail Granlin. Believe me. I mean, you, you need those pieces. I totally, totally get it. But at the same time, what's their record now in the last, like, 13, 14 games? 12-3. and three. I, I, so, yeah, I, I, I can't look at these guys and saying, yeah, we're going to break you up. We're going to break you up, you know, because th- there are, they are beating Dallas. Um, you know, they were totally shorthanded against Tampa. Um, and so, and, and look, Tampa's a Stanley Cup champion, so we're going to lose to them sometimes. Um, and so I, I guess there is a but, um, but you never know. You, you, you don't, you don't know because – if you get by Tampa, Carolina, Florida in round one, then all bets are off. Corey Curtis from News 2 on the line with us, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. So, so, Corey, to that point, I mean, this is almost like two separate seasons for the Predators oh, in the way that Lord, this has yeah. transpired. <laughs> how have they been able to do this, and how much credit do you personally give the young guys who have come in, not only for the way that they've played, but maybe for – the energy that they've instilled with this group as well? Well, I, Robbie, that, that's a huge question. It's a huge question because I know, you know, I've, I've asked some of the guys, you know, how much credit does John Hines deserve because we're giving all the credit to these young guys for injecting energy. Uh, and I think it's a combination of those things because I think, you know, we had a lot of guys here who got really comfortable with, with the way things were. And those guys came in and completely sold out. And I, and I forgot who reported it, so I, I apologize because I'm shorting them. The conversation that he had with Luke Cunnan when he was coming back from injury yep. and basically told him, you're going to play this way or you're not going to play because I've got other guys who are willing to do it. And has Luke Cunnan been a completely different player since he's come back? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, he, he has. And largely because the whole team's been hurt, each one of these guys who comes back from injury – is kind of a different player. Ryan Johansson has even been a little bit different since he's come back. And I think these guys see the writing on the wall that there are guys waiting in the wings to play instead of them. 
and I and I and I think that competitive juice has has elevated some of these guys. So I will say their their effort level on the ice maybe has been contagious, but I think the competition and fear that it originally instilled has now created more energy and more what did John call it a, a spirit for the game um, because they look like the team. I mean, I've been here since 2003, um, and, and they look like they they look like a Barry Trotz team now. They look like a team that comes out and plays hard every night. Yeah, no, no, you're right. I mean, it's been look, I the guys in the locker room, you know, deserve a ton of credit. Um, and it's possible that if you if you were to tinker with it, especially as banged up as you are, you could uh, make it go the wrong way. It's also possible that you roll with this, don't make it, and then there's mm-hmm. a whole bunch of second guessing in a few weeks. But uh, but I That's hear what true. you're saying. So I, l- let me switch gears with you, Corey. TSU, Eddie George, yeah. your reaction? <laughs> wow, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I'm stunned. I, I'm, I'm I'm flabbergasted. I first saw the stuff about it on Thursday or Friday. And I'll be, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. And, you know, I've had a relatively close relationship with Eddie for a long time. And I, and I shot him some messages, and I, and I haven't heard back from him. Um, and, you know, and, you know, it's not that I don't think he can do it, because, I mean, Eddie, and I guess this is my whole point, he's done so many things. He has so many interests. And being a college coach is so life-consuming. Um, I'm, I'm going to be interested to see, you know, how how he jumps into that and how he handles that and how he embraces that. Um, it's you know it's interesting from a TSU standpoint because it adds some voltage to a program that's largely, you know, looked over now, um, and everybody will be watching to see to see how he does and not just on the field but you know the decisions that he makes, you know the the prominence of the program, can he elevate, can he help them raise money? You know, Rod Reed talked about it yesterday, that the financials are, are a huge burden, you know, for them. So the challenges are many, and, and the concern that I have, you know, for him, because um, I, I want him to succeed, I do, but, you know, being a college football coach is different than being an NFL coach um, or being, like, I say, like Jason Kidd, when he became a coach, like, in, still in the NBA – you don't handle a budget. You don't handle recruiting. You just roll out a ball for twelve guys and, and kind of point them in the right direction. And I'm and I know I'm oversimplifying an NBA head coach, but when you're comparing it to the two, when you're like a college football coach, you're like running a corporation, and it, there's a lot that goes on there. And I'm sure he knows this, and I'm sure he's preparing, you know, to handle it. and And I hope he enjoys it. I think that's the number one thing. I hope he enjoys it because. There's a lot that goes into it, and TSU, like most FCS programs, that's a tough job. That's a really tough job, and uh, you know, I'm I, I'm excited to see how he does. I'm excited to see the staff he puts together, um, but nonetheless, stunning. I, I mean, completely out of left field. Yeah, I I agree 100. percent And Corey, we were talking about this earlier in the show too. Like, I have no idea exactly what kind of a coach he's going to be and what the X's and O's are going to look like, the system he's going to run, all that stuff. But you know this. I mean, just from his personality and thinking back to his playing days as well, you know that when he speaks, people Mm -hmm. are going to listen. And I just wonder how much that voice and that charisma can carry him as he tries to get his feet underneath him and take over what you said uh, is going to be a challenging job coming in here to TSU. I think he can be a lot like Mike Vrabel. Um, in that, you know, look, I, I know Mike, you know, tinkers with everything and he's in on the defense, but I look at Mike Vrabel as a very good head coach because he's a very good leader, okay? He's, he's a very good point man. You know, people can rally to him. He's unmistakable, okay? He's there. Everybody sees him. Everybody hears him. He is, he is a, a lightning rod in the ground, and, and everybody knows he's there. And I think Eddie can be that kind of head coach, you know, like, like Mike Ditka. Okay, Mike Ditka, you know, was a galvanizing, centering force. All right, and I think Eddie can be that kind of guy where he is the leader of the group. And if he hires good assistants, you know, he can lead them and and have the the game and played in his vision. Um, and again, that's not to say that he can't coach, 
because we don't know. We haven't seen him coach. But I, his, his personality, I think the strength is towards leadership. Uh, Lou Holtz used to always talk about cars in the ditch and where she out and who's going to get out and push. He, he can be a guy who can get everybody out of the car pushing together. Um, and then it's, it's putting the rest of it together. So just name a defensive coordinator and tell us why. And that's all you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> you mean to have an actual good reason? Yeah. Well, I, like John, I like John Robinson's reason. Well, continuity is a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Not necessarily, he did a great job. He's a good coach. He's, you know, he had some things go against him last year. Ah, you know, continuity is a good idea. <laughs> and then Corey looks like the stash is going to be in the mix as well. Jeff Fisher, I guess, as a consultant yeah. on this stat, on this stat, that you fires know, me up. Look, I, I, look, whether whether it fires you up or not, it's always good to surround yourself with people who've been there and people who know. And it doesn't sound like Jeff's going to have an overwhelming position, but like you know, he'll be like the Godfather. And look, there's a reason that team NFL head coaches hire veteran coaches to be their assistant head coach quite often and they, they need an ear to, to lean on i mean like do you, don't you think that arthur smith is going to lean on dean Pease? oh yeah he's been coaching for a long long time i mean that's that's what you do and I, I, that that's what smart people do they put people around them that they think are smart and respect so that they can lean doesn't mean they're going to do everything they say but it means they listen to everything that they say because they've been there before Corey Curtis from News 2 has been our guest here on Robbie and Rex Row. Corey, great stuff as always, my friend. Appreciate you taking time to join us. All right, thank you very much. Oh, by the way, I want to give a shout-out to Rob Reed. It yes. was a tough press conference yesterday. That guy has dedicated his life to that school. And, uh, you know, I, I want to say he deserves better. Uh, at the end of the day, we all have to win or lose. Okay, I understand that. But there's a good way and a bad way to go out. And I just, for him and what he has dedicated to that university, I would have liked a more graceful honorary exit. Agreed, and I Good thought call. he was about as classy as you could be yesterday handling that as well. So a great Tough point situation. by you. Absolutely. Corey right, Curtis thanks. joins thanks, us Corey. every week here at 8 o'clock here on Robbie and Rex Road. When we come back, we will get back into the Nashville Predators, look back at the weekend that was for the Preds. What did we learn about this team? What does it mean as they move forward here now with trade deadline day? in the NHL. All that coming up next. This is Robbie and Rex Road here on ESPN 102.5 The Game.
Rupe hints his first shootout attempt of the year. Moves in through the left circle. And the save made by Saros. And the Predators win it. It goes down as a 3-2 victory as the Predators embrace goaltender UC Saros after this win over the Dallas Stars. Hey Ryan, obviously the results on the ice speak for themselves, but just from your vantage point, how much different is the vibe with this group now than it was, you know, three and a half, four weeks ago? We're vibing, probably. Nashville Predators are vibing, baby. Winners of 12 out of their last 15. They win last night against the Dallas Stars, 3-2 to two in the shootout. As we heard there from the illustrious Ryan Johansson, described it beautifully, we're vibing right now. We're vibing, Robbie. Thank you. Robbie and Ryan. Yeah. Vibing. Vibing. Robbie and Ryan. <laughs> what do we think vibing? that means? Vibing pretty well, huh? Vibing, I don't know what I mean. Man, I know what it means. But like what do you think that means for the future? Are they just gonna continue to vibe here? I don't know. Is it can you break up the vibe? I think you can. Maybe you do if you trade <laughs> someone today. Maybe. We're vibing, Robbie. <laughs> Oh, man. Got to love that guy. Another goal in the shootout last night for Ryan Johansson as well. You were there to witness it in person. What did you think of that one? Perfectly respectable shootout goal. This one was respectable. The other one's not so much. Well, right. The ones where you stop. He didn't stop. And wait for five minutes. (laughs) Yeah, that that shouldn't be allowed. Sorry. I'd say the one that Yarn Croak tried to pull off last night was worse than what what you hate, Joe. I agree. I was I I will say I didn't like the Yarn Croak approach. Like I'm gonna skate all the way over here, and then I'm gonna go all the way over here, and then stop and get stopped. But it wasn't great description. It, thank you. <laughs> it, it, it basically did a figure eight, but it wasn't like just skate really slow and then stop and stand there and then shoot, which should not be allowed. Johansson, a little bit of a different approach last night in the shootout. He came in, he had a little speed to start with. I was like, whoa, where's this going? And then hits the brakes. I was like, okay, we're settling back into the routine here. And then just fired it. I think he yeah. totally, I mean, obviously, he totally took Anton Hudobin by surprise. Hudobin was ready for him to slow it down, and he was going to try to wait him out and see if he could wait out Johansson. And Johansson saw an opening. He took it, and that was the only goal in the entire shootout. Roman Yossi obliterated a post right after that, and Joe Pavelski did as well for the Stars. But the only goal in the shootout, Ryan Johansson. Yeah, it was it was very good. It was exactly. I mean, my favorite guy to watch in those shootouts is Forsberg, because he comes in and it's just pick a spot and fire. I don't know how he compares to Johansson, but I I know that pretty good. it's much more aesthetically pleasing. And also, Soros now has not allowed a goal in eight attempts in the shootout this pretty year. Pretty good. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Yeah. To not. I mean, I know eight's not a lot, but still, like to not allow one. It's pretty good. Well, you you talk about a guy that we've talked about. He's not the biggest guy. Like, you're trying to go and roof it on him. And and in fairness, I mean, Pavelski beat him yesterday. He hit the post, though. It's not part of the net. You got to hit the net. So, Soros has been really good in the shootout. He was good once again last night. Not only in the shootout, but the entire game. I, I thought last night, Joe, a really important response. You know, you look at the game on Saturday against Tampa Bay. And Tampa, I mean, they're starting to figure some things out. Now, they they didn't have Stamkos in that game, and I don't think they're going to have Stamkos tomorrow night either against the Predators. It looks like he may be back or at least close to coming back when they return back home. I think they're playing against Florida at home later this week. So it looks like Stamkos not going to be in there tomorrow against the Predators as well. I thought the Preds Saturday played well. Like You lose 3 to nothing, and you're frustrated, I think, by the final score. But I thought five on five, they played really well against the Lightning to the point where, you know, I think you're encouraged by that. Like there's no such thing as like a moral victory in the NHL. But the Predators were very positive after that game. I mean, they, they were not discouraged. They didn't talk about, you know, what a tough loss it was. They were pretty encouraged by the way that they played. And I thought it was important to respond to that against Dallas in a game that was huge. I mean, you look at the standings right now, and, and Dallas still has three games in hand on the Predators. But you get that done last night in the shootout. You're at 47 points, Dallas at 41. You've got a six-point cushion. Like Just think about what it could have looked like if you lose that game in regulation. You're talking about then 
a three-point gap between you and the Stars. I mean, it's a massive swing last night to get that win. Oh, no doubt. And I agree with you on the on the Tampa Bay. I mean, I think arguably that's the best they've played against Tampa Bay this year with a totally just gutted lineup. Yeah. And some bad luck and just the bad luck of running into Vasilevsky the way he's playing. He's so good right now. Uh, but I think there was a lot to be encouraged by. And then you wonder, okay, but then the next night can you come back and and put it together for really a bigger game? And they and they did, and they figured out a way. I and mean, there were times in the third period last night where they just looked like an exhausted team. Yeah. They were hemmed in on that one possession that was just I need to go endless. back and get the official time for that. I mean, it was at least a minute and a half, right? At least. I mean, it felt like eight minutes. Yeah. And, you know, the the penalty kill, too. The penalty kill was huge last night, and uh, there was the one in the third period. They were really on the ropes and exhausted and figured it out, and Soros figured it out, and, you know, he, he was better last night than – he did not have many, if any, like, whoa, saves, but he was just so good. And I think Hal Gill made the point in the postgame show, like, there are there are some plays, some saves he makes because of his anticipation – that look routine, but actually they're really not. Let's go back to the text line driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. Nate text in, should Janot's new nickname be the Hulk? He looked like it last night. Tanner Janot throwing people around. He hit Alexiak twice and just dumped him. I mean, you're talking about a guy, Alexiak 6'7", I want to say 255, 260, somewhere in that neighborhood. And Trennan and Janot running around last night just crushing people. Yeah. No, it was fun to watch, and it's amazing when you you know when you bring that up about Alexiak that also he by the way he skated through the entire team yeah, at did. one point that was actually that actually might have been Trennan right there it was Trennan yeah, yeah. who uh, need needed to pick him up but no nah, I mean that I mean that fourth line is and again they don't have Olivier right now but those guys are they they set a tone really I think for this team and they set a tone that hasn't been settable in yep. recent years they haven't you know you know the preds we know well like you bring back a cody mcleod because just to have a guy like that but right you gotta have someone who can skate and play hockey you that's, know? That's, a, that's the thing with these guys like they can play yeah like Tanner Trent, Janot, trenton is really good he's good he, i mean he gets a goal last night Jano, he's got 21 points in 13 games at the ahl he's just lighting it up at the ahl these guys can play so that's that's really encouraging to me. If you're like, I'll be honest with you, like Tanner Janot is not a guy that I've thought about as being a part of the Predators' future here. I mean, he is, and stock is rising this year. And it's one game last night at the NHL level. I realize that, but you're talking about a guy lighting it, lighting it up at the AHL level, proving that he can come in and give you some valuable minutes. I mean, what did that fourth line end up with? Twelve minutes last night, roughly in, yeah. in the ballpark there, like. Obviously, John Hines trusts that line right now, and I, I thought a really impressive response by the Predators. And as I said, just to get those points and to con- continue to extend that cushion from you and the Stars is crucial. And they've got you know next week a, a big stretch coming up to against Chicago, where you're going to play them three times in a row. I mean, those those are massive games coming up for the Predators. So uh, a big response by them yesterday. And now the question becomes. What does it mean in terms of the decisions that David Poyle and the Predators are going to have to make today? The NHL trading deadline at 2 o'clock. What do you think the Predators should do? We'll get back into that coming up next. This is Robbie and Rex Road here on ESPN 102.5 The Game.
I think that, you know, Monday comes and goes probably with Nashville being a quiet team that we don't hear a lot of noise around. Unless it's, unless it's a small deal with Grandland or a small deal with Ericala, I don't necessarily see Nashville as making the big splash. Now, this can all change if someone calls David Poyle and knocks his socks off for a deal for Matias Ekholm and Philip Forsberg or Ryan Ellis or whomever. But I don't know that I see that happening in a flat cap universe right now. That was Jeff Merrick from Sportsnet on with us here on the show last week talking about the trade deadline and how that could look for the Predators coming up today, the deadline at 2 p.m. Central Time. So not a whole lot of time left for the Predators to make a decision on which way they're going to go. Welcome back in. Robbie and Rex Road, you're on ESPN 1025 The Game. Speaking of the Predators, make sure you're tuning in this hour for your cue to call for a chance to win a pair of tickets to see the Predators take on the Tampa Bay Lightning tomorrow at Bridgestone Arena. We'll have that cue to call coming up a little bit later here in this hour, so make sure you're tuned in for that. Also, do you want to pass along some breaking news this coming uh, here locally? A shooting suspect is reportedly on foot in the Stonebridge subdivision area of Leeville Pike in Lebanon. So uh, that's according to police. All residents in the area should stay locked in their homes until further notice. So if you are in that area or you know of people in that area, uh, make sure you pass that along and make sure uh, you stay locked in your homes there until the police uh, get this situation resolved. So wanted to pass that along. Uh, That's all over the news right now. Mm. So Joe, looking ahead at the deadline coming up today, the question that I have is what should the Predators do? at today's deadline they've complicated things it was going in a clear path that we've talked a lot about over the course of the last month and then you roll off 12 out of 15 wins I mean that's going to make you feel really good if you're the Nashville Predators about the trajectory that you're on and that is the subject of today's poll question at 1025 the game on Twitter Preds fans what do you want to see the team do before today's two o'clock trade deadline do you want to see them sell do you want to see them stand pat Or would you like to see them buy? 267 votes are in. 45% say stand pat. 43% say sell. 12% say they would like to see the Predators buy. So very close between sell and stand pat. And a little bit of buy in there as well. The pure trolls called the 12%. Come on. Who are you? Are you a Blackhawks fan? Are you a Blues fan? I think there are some Predators fans that have seen enough to Corey Curtis's point. They think this is what they are now and would like to see them go out and buy a piece or two. Not a huge one, but to add some depth. Yeah, okay. I'm not saying (laughs) that I agree with it. I'm just saying I think those opinions exist. Yeah, that's true. I've heard that Pred's Facebook is interesting. Yes. Uh, Would this be like a Facebook-Twitter crossover? Maybe so. Doesn't like Pred's Facebook. Oh, it's a, think, it's like, a rough Mike, place. Mike Fisher saw on the team. And yeah, stuff? Yeah. There, there are some. That's for sure. It's quite a crew. Uh, it's very interesting to me that Stan Pat is beating yeah. Sell. I thought so too. Um, I that think was not the lot, case when we asked a similar poll question like a week and a half ago. If they stand Pat and either don't make the playoffs or if they even like get just get blown out in the first round but some of those people will be second guessing themselves well that's my that's a, that's an interesting question because i i, I want to throw that out there to you and to our listeners you can let us know on our text line driven by wilson county hyundai.com 615-737-1025 615-737-1025 Let, let's say for the sake of this discussion the predators don't do anything today and they stand pat at the deadline grandland's still here hall is still here and they're taking a run at this thing to try to make a run in the playoffs. Like, how deep of a run would it take for the Predators to make for us to believe, okay, well, that was not a mistake. Like, they they were were right to leave this team together. Because obviously, like, to me, if they're out in the first round, I think it's pretty easy to look back at the deadline and say, well, you probably should have gotten some assets for Granlin or some assets for Hall, whatever way you want to slice it. But, like, what is your – cutoff point like is it a run to the western conference final is it second round like how deep of a run would it take for you to believe holding on to this group and holding on to these assets at the deadline was the right call i mean you'll have some people that'll say they got to win the cup and that's it if you don't win the cup it's a waste of time well yeah and i think that's a little extreme i don't know i I mean i'll say this if they get in 
and they give you a good – like if they got in and they played Tampa Bay the way they played them the other night for an entire series – and didn't get swept, you know, I guess. But he, but just got in and were competitive in a series. Then I think you could still justify it with the fact that it is important for an organization in this climate after a year of pandemic with no to reduce crowds, with the cap going nowhere for a while, all that stuff, with wanting to sell season tickets next year and what you hope is a full arena, all. I mean, you have to – I mean, the, the business considerations can't be too far from mine, I think especially in this league. So that, to me, is – it's worth discussing. Now, my counter to that, which is why I still think they should sell, is I don't think that you are necessarily tearing it all down if you sell off Macau Granlin. You aren't – dooming yourself to not make the playoffs. If you can do what you've done with all these guys missing and you're going to get some of them back, that's another part of the – that's another piece of information we don't know. Are these guys coming back like week to week means what? If it's three weeks from now, okay, well, then you may not score another goal <laughs> at some point, you know, if, if you if you get rid of any players. So then you may be punting on the playoffs. And that's not ideal because these guys have worked their butts off to get into this position. But I still think the big picture, what is the trajectory? Where are things going? How close are you to actually being a Stanley Cup contender? I hear what Corey Curtis was saying earlier. 17. People bring it up. The Kings. You get in. Get in. And, and something could happen, right? It's possible. I mean, the way these guys are playing, and the way Staros is playing in particular, I'd like to see them in a playoff series and see what they could do. Yeah. But – there's some level of retool here at, still ahead, right? Well, there's got to be. There has to be. So, if and, you get a good offer today, I think you have to take it. Well, but, and the question is, like, what does the retool look like? Could the retool be as simple as, hey, a lot of these young guys are going to be playing. Like, that's going to be the permanent decision here in the lineup is Matthew Olivier is going to be a permanent player. Tanner Janot at some point is going to be a permanent player. We know about Tolvin. He's going to be a permanent player. Trennan. Trennan. Carrier. Like, maybe that's part of the retool here is these guys, the future is now for these guys. They're going to come in, and this is going to be the new core that you try to build around. Obviously, with Yossi still there and Forsberg still there, got a big decision to make down the middle between jo Johansson and Duchesne coming up and how that may factor into the expansion draft. But I mean, who are your top six forwards? Right now? For the future. Maybe Tomasito gets in there, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Tomasino's in there. Is, is, is Cunning part of your future? He is not a top six forward. Not to me. Like I, I think he's a good third line guy. Like, I, I I don't anticipate Luke Cunning being a top six forward on a team that's got a chance to win a cup. See, the whole thing is there's a lot to, to like a lot about the young guys and what they've done. And you, you, look, you still feel great about core players like Forsberg, obviously, like you said, Yossi. I mean, at home, if you're, you're keeping him, we think so. I mean, it really comes down to, okay, well, if all that works out well, the young guys keep progressing. I mean, Arvidsson, I think, is a question still, too. But is Soros this? Yeah. If he's this, then okay, then I can see it being awfully good. Yeah. Is he this? And, I mean, listen, maybe some people would jump all over me for saying, what are you talking about? We watch him every night. But come on. I mean, early this year, I mean, I, we wrote him off. I basically well, did. They put up a graphic yesterday on the broadcast, and it kind of highlighted – I don't remember exactly how many games it was, but it was through like mid February, and he had an 886 save percentage. And now, I mean, his total save percentage is it, it's a 930. I mean, he's, it's been incredible the run that he's been on, but it's not, that's the thing. It's not been just strictly that way. Now, we're getting to the point now where this is more than, than just a hot streak, I think. I think he's playing really well, and I think it's fair to ask has he figured something out in his game? that has allowed him to be more consistent. I, exactly. I think that's, that's a fair question. And if, if he has, that's a great sign for the Predators moving forward. I just – I'm still not yet willing to go there that this is absolutely what Soros is moving forward. Right. I mean, and there's another reason why it would be potentially beneficial beyond the instant gratification of making the playoffs. Yeah. It would be good to be able to see him in a playoff series it against would. a really good team. 
Gator Z on Twitch asks, is there a point where David Poyle sits down, Hines and Yossi specifically, and goes with what they believe? So I guess talking about the deadline today, asking Yossi and Hines what they want to do, and then going with that. My guess would be no. Like, probably more so with Hines. He probably factors in that decision. Like, I think they've gone down this route before of leaving it up to the players and wanting – you know what you're, you know what Roman Yossi's going to say. Keep his thing together. Let's let's go. Yossi, we got to get Mikhail out of here. Yeah. Like, you, Come on. you, you know <laughs> what? More young guys. Let's all rookies. Come you on. You don't really need to have a conversation with Yossi. Like, you, you know what he's going to say. Hines is interesting. Like, I kind of feel like right now if I'm John Hines – I would say we've won 12 out of 15. Have I've we, been preaching this the whole time, and now they finally bought in. This is what we are. Like That's probably what I would say if I'm John Hines. Have we not earned this opportunity? Look at how many guys are hurt, what this would do. And if you're John Hines, you also – you have – well, you basically have brought Macau Grandland back to Minnesota-type levels of play. Yeah. Which is – he was far below that with Laviolette. So I think if you're Hines, like you, you'd like to have Grandland in your lineup. So he loves Grandland. Yeah. But I don't think, I mean, I don't know. You, I could be wrong. I just, I would think Poyle is basically talking to people on the phone yeah. and that's where the decision is made. Preds fans join one Oh two five, the game on Wednesday from six to 7 PM for Smashville live featuring Preds players, former players, and other special guests. You can also watch the show online via 1025 The Game's Twitch, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and TheGameNashville.com. Smashville Live, brought to you by New Amsterdam Vodka, Spring Hill Heating and Cooling, and Red Spirits and Wine in Bellevue. To view or listen to past shows, go to TheGameNashville.com slash Smashville Live. When we come back, we will continue the discussion on the Nashville Predators and the trade deadline. A lot of your thoughts to get to on our text line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com, 615-737-1025, 615-737-1025. All that coming up next. This is Robbie and Rex Road here on ESPN 1025 The Game.
Welcome back in. Robbie and Rex Road here on ESPN 1025. The game streaming live on Periscope, on YouTube, and on Twitch as well. Discussing all things Nashville Predators. Looking ahead to the deadline coming up today at 2 p.m. Central in the National Hockey League. Some moves have already been made. Nick Foligno to the Toronto Maple Leafs. Columbus gets back a first-round pick. As the uh, the game was getting ready to take place on Saturday against Tampa Bay, Savard, David Savard, traded to the Tampa Bay Lightning. First-round pick back for Columbus in that one as well. Taylor Hall on the move last night to the Boston Bruins. Jeff Carter on the move from L.A. to the Pittsburgh Penguins. So some bigger names have been moved around out there, and maybe, maybe some more to come today. We talked earlier in the show about Ryan Getzlaff. What does his future look like with the Anaheim Ducks? So... Going to be a very interesting next few hours here at the NHL trade deadline. And, of course, we'll keep you updated all day long here on ESPN 102.5 The Game. Joe, let's go to the text line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. Josh texts in and says, So, Joe, if they stand pat and win in the first round and lose in five in the second round, are you satisfied with that? I mean, I, I – well, look I- – yeah, I mean, if they won a playoff series, they get in the playoffs, win a playoff series, given how this season has gone. I mean, okay, the question, are you satisfied with that? I still would say it's too bad they missed out on an opportunity to try to build assets, which for many years they were letting go the other way in an attempt to go for it. So short of a cup, I would say it's still, like, not ideal – to go through this day and not build some assets back because this is, I think, a time when they should be thinking about that. Um, and you know, we don't, we're not going to get prices. You know, we're, I, I don't think we will. Probably not. We're not going to. We're not going to find out exactly what was offered, when, and by who. You know, and so again, it's not just simple door A or door B sell or don't i mean it's what are you being offered back in return also how important is it to make the playoffs for the organization sometimes that stuff comes into play i mean you have to take you know it's not just the performance on the ice or on the court or field sometimes business is important especially in a year like this and then also what do you know about the injury situation right now if you're gonna gut this team that has worked to, to get into this position knowing that a bunch of those key guys are two, three weeks out, I think they'd have a reason to be angry with you. I still say if you had a good offer, you still do it, but there's just so many factors involved in this, and that is a very long answer to your question. Ryan Porth, let me ask you this question because, I, look, I, I think it's easy to say win a Stanley Cup, that'll, that'll make it worth it to hold on to the assets. But realistically, looking at this, if if today comes and goes and, and no move is made by the Predators at the deadline, or at least no significant move, like I'm not talking a minor league trade or anything like that, no significant move to this roster, what sort of a run will it take for the Predators to convince you that it was the right call to stand pat and do nothing at the deadline? Well, let me kind of reverse it. If they do nothing and they make the playoffs, that's a failure of what didn't happen at today's deadline if they don't make any moves i mean i think it would be hard to sit here and say that if they don't make any moves before 2 p.m then the expectation is they have to go out and beat tampa or carolina in the first round i think that's unfair for that to become the adjusted expectation just because you didn't make a trade before 2 p.m um you know, Joe brought up the the economics of it. You get a a, a postseason appearance this year. It it helps you. Uh, it helps any NHL team that has been affected by COVID to be able to get playoff revenue. Sure. Um, I mean, they would probably have to win in the first round for them to come away from the trade deadline saying it was the right move to not trade anybody. I mean. I still sit here and say that if – if I, I mean, I agree with you all. If Granlund is being – or if Poyle is being offered a first or second for, for Granlund, then you have to take it. You just have to. I, I guess the flip side to that is what if it's Colorado offering you that second-round pick? Then it's going to be in, like, you know, the 60s. Yeah. What good does that do you? I mean, 
it's going to be a late second round pick when everybody's going to say, oh, well, it's essentially a third round pick then. So you, you, I don't know if that's a reason to say no, but the value of that second round pick isn't going to be as good if it's Colorado making that call as it is if it's, say, Florida. Agreed. No, I think that's a great point. I think you've got to factor that in if you're David Poyle too. And it's also like trying to nail down what the value is for a Grandland. Like Nick Felino goes, he gets a first round pick back from Toronto. Now, Toronto came out at this point, it's almost been a month since Kyle Dubas came out and said, Yeah, we don't mind giving up a first round pick for an asset if we feel like they can come in and help. And, and we want an asset that's going to be a free agent and we don't have to worry about protecting him in the expansion draft. Like he was very open about what the plan was. So I, I'm not really surprised that they've given up a first-round pick to go get Nick Foligno. What I wonder is, okay, what does that mean for Grandland's value? Taylor Hall goes to Buffalo, and he's just packaged with – or from Buffalo to Boston, packaged with Curtis Lazar, and he fetches a second-round pick and Andres Bjork in that return, which is it's not a whole lot. Like, it's not a great return for Buffalo when it comes to trading a guy like Taylor Hall. So trying to figure out exactly – what the value would be right now for Granlin, I think is difficult. And who else is interested? Like who who are the teams left that are interested in going out and acquiring a guy like him that, that's worth it and making that deal if you're the Predators? I mean, it's it's a really fascinating question. And I, I'm not sure exactly where his value lies at this point. Yeah, are they like angry in Buffalo? I mean they're already they, just they horrific. Are. They are yeah. mad. <laughs> I mean, More, they're like a perpetual state of mad, yeah. but they yeah, they were mad last night at that return. More good news for the Sabres. Yeah. Well, again, if we're going to do the play it down the road thing here in terms of the playoffs, what if they flame out in the playoffs, but they re-sign Granlund? And they work it out to where, you know, one of the other centers is ex- expansion drafted away. Yeah. They keep Granlund long term. Probably worth it at that point. So you got to let a lot of things play out, no matter what happens today. Sure, I mean, it, this no story, more opinions until then. This story's not over today. That's that's for sure. And even you know, guys that I, we, we've talked a little bit less about as of late, Eckholm, Ellis, like the expansion draft's a real thing. Like you're going to have to do something. My guess is you're probably going the seven three and one route this year, which means you're protecting seven forwards, three defensemen, one goalie, and the goalie's going to be Soros. So, I mean, how does that affect what you do if you're David Poyle? When you know you've got Fabro, who I get it, there's a lot of, I think, Fabro detractors at the moment. He's not been great this year, but he's still, he's 22. He's a first round pick. Like, they're not just going to abandon hope on Dante Fabro at this point. So, you've got Yossi, who you know is going to be protected. You've got Fabro. You've got Ellis. You've got Ekholm. Unless you're going the four four one route or like you did last time, like uh, you've got a decision to make on that front. So I'm interested to see how that factors into this discussion as well. Now I don't know if that necessarily happens today. Maybe a trade like that happens right near the expansion draft. But these are these are things you can't ignore if you're David Poyle, and I'm he's not ignoring them. Like this is all factoring into the decision making process today. If they were to leave Ellis unprotected, would he get scooped right up? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, his his contract, you worry about it, I think, from an injury standpoint. But it's not, it's not, not that bad. No. I mean, it's $6.25 million. And it's it's not cheap, but it's not that bad. So I, I think if they left him exposed, yeah. So who would they leave exposed? On defense? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I mean, is Fabro definitely going to get scooped up? Yeah. I think any of those four you leave exposed, Seattle's taking them. But, I mean, me. you, but I mean, you can make a trade with somebody before sure, the yeah, expansion I, yeah, draft. Yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. I, I, think, think, I think some fans view it as today is the no, day this to – This is it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, you can over. make a trade before the expansion draft. Yeah, yeah with, a big, with a big piece like that, for sure. And that may well happen. This is, this is boiled down now to the expiring contract conversation, yes. right? Yes. Unless something happens until, today. Until I, I mean, go goals today. Matias yeah. Ekholm still on the big board for NHL.com. He's, he's a defenseman to watch today at the deadline. I'm not saying it can't happen. I, I think I have moved to the point where, you know, three weeks ago, if you'd told me Matias Ekholm would be traded at the deadline, I wouldn't have been all that surprised. I'd be surprised now. Yeah. 
So I would too, but yeah. Crazier things have We've happened. We've been surprised before. That's right. When we, we come back. We all had Eddie George as TSU's head coach last week. <laughs> That's right. When we come back, we'll continue the conversation on the Nashville Predators. Darren McFarland, host of Darren, Donick, and Chase, also handles the Predators pre- and post-game duties for the Nashville Predators Radio Network. He'll join us next. This is Robbie and Rex Road, live from the Wholesaling Studios, powered by RumbleOn.com. You're on ESPN 102.5 The Game. Welcome back in. Hour number four of Robbie St- and Rex Road here on ESPN 1025. Again, I'm all said hour number four of Robbie Stanley. Just completely cut you out of the show. The Robbie Stanley Show, everybody. That would have been total disrespect. That would have been certainly on next week's edition of the Rex Rant. 
Just right after me. Yeah, you would have. You would just give me my next one. And also, it's better than the uh, mistake you almost just made with your hashtag, though. So that's true. We'll leave that one discussion <laughs> off the air. So thank you for pointing that out. No problem. Streaming live here on Periscope and on YouTube and on Twitch as well. Talking all things Nashville Predators, and we are pleased to be joined. By Darren McFarland, host of Darren, Donick, and Chase, also handles the pre- and post-game duties for the Nashville Predators Radio Network. Darren, what's going on, brother? How we doing? Guys, I've got four fingers up to signify the final hour. This is, you know, like nice. we're a college oh, football Yes, oh, yes. Four. I'm doing that now, streaming. Come like, on. I really thought that would go away by now, but Still how has it lasted this long? Like, I, honestly. I thought like, Butch Jones would officially be the one to kill it. <laughs> like, he, he kind of puts things into overkill anyway, but it's still hanging on. It's mm-hmm. still hanging on. I mean, when it first happened, it's was like, oh, okay, cute. All right, signifies final quarter, guys. Let's go. And then it's like, I didn't think this many years later we would still be talking about four fingers being up going into the fourth quarter, but, but here we are. But here we are, and it's going to be a great fourth hour here on the program. Darren, I want to start. We'll get into the the trade deadline stuff coming up here in just a few minutes. But I, I want to start with just the weekend that was for the Nashville Predators. A 3 nothing loss to Tampa Bay, where I actually thought they played pretty well in that game. And then a huge response yesterday to get those two points, 3-2 to two in overtime against the Dallas Stars. What did you think of the weekend for the Predators? Did you learn anything about the Predators this weekend that maybe affects how you view the deadline coming up today? I don't know if I learned anything. Guys, this is what I I really love about this team from this weekend. They're a fun team to watch. They're fun. I mean, if you don't enjoy this team, then I I guess they're just not going to have you, right? I mean, you're you're just not going to be a fan. They are fun to watch. This team gets after it. This is what everybody's been looking for. When they've been trending the wrong way, it's pretty clear, you know, what was the biggest difference in why they were trending the wrong way. They had big names, they had big contracts, but they weren't playing the way you, you have to play at this level. This team is fun, man. They get after it. They get after you. And I agree with you, Robbie. I, I know it's all about results, and so you, you can't pat yourself on the back too much on Saturday. You lo- you got shut out for the fourth time this season. But they played a really good game, and this just in, a stink and lightning are pretty good. Vasilevsky is the best goalie in the league, although UC Saros, the way he's playing, boy, he's certainly making a case. He is playing out of his mind. But, you know, Tampa's the defending Stanley Cup champs. And then, you know, Dallas was the same type of game. By the way, Saturday was chippy. Sunday was chippy. Both games felt like rivalry games. Both games felt like playoff games. And this team is doesn't stand down to anybody. They push back. Now, you know, I don't think they need to have hits like McCarron did late in the game, and and the league has spoken and suspended him for two games. But I don't think we learned it, but I think we are learning that this is what John Hines has been preaching the entire time since he's taken over. Like, this is what it was going to take, and this team was not playing the way you're supposed to in the National Hockey League to have success. And since they've, you know, this last 15 games where they've gone 12-3, and they just get after it. They're fun to watch. The minute they jump, that fourth line, when they jump over the wall, I, I don't know how you're not glued to watching that fourth line. And how many times do you say that about a team, right? Yep. Like, man, that fourth line really gets me excited. They do. They're fun to watch. No, I totally agree. They, they, it was a blast watching those guys last night. And, of course, Olivier is not even in there right now. And Hal, uh, Gil, brought up with you in the post game last night, Darren. You know, think about – that line and the tone they set and how useful they could have been two years ago, you know, in that playoff series. No doubt. You know, I mean, it's like th- it gives them a chance against a team like this to, uh, you know, to, to be able to tangle with them. Um, to, the, to your point about fun, I, I would argue this is as fun a stretch for this franchise since the President's Trophy year. I would argue that. Like, yeah. the, even though they won the division the next year, like, it was still kind of angst-filled, like it wasn't going the right way, and then we know yeah. last year, right? Like, mm-hmm. okay, so my question to you, and by the way, I'm getting texted, by the way, by – now, I'm used to Stillman texting me, but, I mean, this is a preview of your show. So, Willie's texting me now to get oh, in wow. on this. Yeah, so we okay. got the whole thing all – so here, let me let me just throw this, this question great. at you. Is, hey, why don't we just combine the shows? We'll just go live. Let's do it. Let's just combine the shows, and we'll just do six a six or a five man show. Boy, I just my math, Kentucky math. We'll just do a <laughs> five man show till two o'clock. Hey, Let's do it. The Simulcast. DDC plus RR. That's right. It's a lot of letters. 
As long as we can keep Jared out. Uh, that sounds like a very <laughs> official organization, by the way, the DDC plus RR. Yes, I mean, it that's, does. You don't want them on your front porch. No, you don't. <laughs> All right, so let me ask you this. Is Granlund – the glue holding everything together, the most important forward on a team, and is there any way the Preds make the playoffs without him? Uh, let me just say this before I answer your question. Tanner Janot, we, we ever brought up, uh, he hit everything but the Zamboni last <laughs> yes. night. He did, yes. I mean, it was – that was awesome. Like I, my, my, my walk-off line last night was the fourth line had more hits than the Beatles. I mean, wow. they were ever – I mean, they had 12 hits last night. It felt like 34 hits. And probably Dallas would argue that it was just 12. But to answer your question, look, Granlin has been spectacular. Uh, Granlin has really been a different player since John Hines has taken over, even when they didn't play like this, even when they weren't having the success. Granlin, for whatever reason, it has worked on John Hines' watch. Is he the glue, Joe? That, for me, that that's a bit of a stretch. I, I think, one – when you're playing like this, you're going to have to be doing this as a team. Everybody's going to have to be on the same page. Look, you can tell this is rubbing off. Look, when players go away for any significant amount of time, what do they look like when they come back? They look like their hair's on fire, right? Luke Cunning missed 13 games. What did he do? He came back, boom. Ryan Ellison has missed 20 games. How's he looked these last two games? What, you get, what I'm getting at is it looks like this team is having an effect, and when you're sitting there watching, you want to get back and be a part of that, right? And, and Ryan, I think Ryan Ellis was chomping at the bit to get back and be a part of this. I think Luke Cunning was chomping at the bit to be a part of this, and so I don't think it's one person. Uh, you know, Granlin has been great, but he's not the glue. It's not one person. They've all bought in. They're all playing the right way. All the lines, up and down the lineup, and it doesn't matter because, as we've seen, I mean, it's almost like a riddle or a puzzle every pregame, Joe. We're trying to figure out who's in the lineup, who's out, who's suspended, who's on pro, you know, who's been injured, who's in the lineup. Oh, you're oh seven defensemen this game. I mean, it's it's a puzzle to figure this roster out from game to game. But you know what doesn't change? The way they play. It doesn't matter who you – you stick in Tanner. Tanner Janot is a 23-year-old undrafted guy who just played in his second NHL game last night, and we're talking about him. You're not supposed to talk about Tanner Janot. But look at the – you think he's bought in? You think he's been sitting there watching this team? He understands what they're doing. So I don't think any one person is the glue. Can they make the playoffs if they trade, if they make trades today? My answer is yes, because the team has bought in. Well, you and Willie will have some good arguments today, then. That's right. So, is he he disagrees? Yeah. Okay. So, get ready. Good. That's right. <laughs> great. <laughs> Darren make for a great show. Host of Darren Donick Chase, also handles the Predators pre- and post-game duties for the Nashville Predators Radio Network. On the line with us, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. Darren, as you look at this, and as you look at the deadline coming up today at 2 o'clock, I've said it for the last few weeks, I still haven't changed I, I think a soft sell to some degree, whether it's Halla and Granlin, one of the two is still on the table if I'm David Poyle. And especially, like, you see Nick Foligno get a first-round pick. I mean, th that has to get your, your wheels turning if you're David Poyle. But I also, the more time that goes by and the more that I watch this team play, if I had to guess, my guess would be that nothing happens today and that they stand pat at the deadline. What is your best guess as to what happens today for the Predators. I would lean with what you're saying, and, and this is what people have to keep in mind because I've already, you know, it's it's great to have the fans back in there. It, it, it's not to the level that we're used to, but, hey, it's it, there's an atmosphere finally. I mean, last night, I mean, they they got chance going in yeah. the third period. I mean, it was awesome. It started to feel like, you know, we're back to, dare I say, normal, you know, kind of, close, just better. Like when you hear the chants and people are going crazy trying to will this team to a victory, you have to love it. But but people are, you know, they're coming back into Barrel House, stopping by, saying hello. So you're having the conversations with the fans again. That helps for it to feel normal. And for everybody panicking, saying, oh, my gosh, you've got to do something, you've got to do something, and if they don't do anything – like, oh, my goodness, what does that mean? Well, what does that mean is they can still make trades when the season is over, and I don't rule that out. I I don't think really th anything is – but when you look at the trade tracker, uh, 
right now, the Bruins just made their big splash. The Penguins just traded for Jeff Carter. The Islanders have been making moves. The Bruins have been making moves. Toronto certainly has been extremely active. Who else is out there? I mean, I guess you hear Winnipeg may still be very interested in a trade, but I kind of feel like the players involved, they, they've kind of done their work. They may be done. They may be closing up shops. So I don't think there's really – a whole lot maybe on the table for David Poyle to discuss. So if they don't do anything, or it is, like you said, an extremely soft sell, doesn't rule. doesn't mean that they're done. It doesn't mean that this is how this is all going to play out. They can still make moves in the offseason, and I suspect with the expansion draft that if nothing does happen – with players that we've talked about, there'll be discussions in the offseason. I know the expiring contract guys will not be involved in that, but um, I, I just, at this point, I don't see much happening because I'm not sure who's the trading partner out there. Can you guys tell me who you see as a trading partner? Like I said, Winnipeg. Tell me I mean, somebody else. Colorado maybe in the mix. Vegas. Uh, Florida. To, like Florida freed up money the other day, and they've not done anything since then. So you, you feel like maybe they're a team to keep an eye on the day. But, but to your point, moves, you know? yeah, but I, I just – there, there's not a ton left out there. There's and are you going to trade to Colorado when they're going to be back in your division next year? Mm, I don't know. You now, know. If it's Grandland, you're probably less worried about that in terms of the, the contract. I mean, he'll be a free agent. But, yeah, True. I mean, it's a, it's a point you've got to think about for sure. Yeah. So I, I agree with you. My, my gut feeling is – and I've said all along. I've been very consistent with my message. And, you know, I think that whatever you've been talking about before all this started in the last 15 games is what you should still be talking about today – if it's right now, if it means if, if the prices have gone down and people just aren't offering the same amount, then you walk away. But if your plan was whatever it was three, four weeks ago, I, I don't think anything's changed. That's just my opinion. I've been very consistent about it. I've said it with you guys on Mondays, and I've said it on Darren Donick and Chase. Um, I, I just I think the plan should have always been intact, and I don't know what the plan was, but whatever you were talking about three or four weeks ago should still be the plan today as we get to the trade. What is it, at 2 o'clock our time? 2 o'clock. Yeah, 2 o'clock. So, uh, I, but I, I suspect the way they've been playing, the moves that have already happened, that, yeah, probably going to be non-eventful here in this market. Darren McFarland, host of Darren, Donick, and Chase, also handles the Nashville Predators pre- and post-game duties for the Predators Radio Network, has been our guest here on Robbie and Rex Road. You can hey, catch him hey, Robbie, 10 to 2. Can I, can I say this real quick? You sure I can. just want to thank both of you for – helping me, inspiring me at First Horizon Park because when I was walking in the concourse oh, yeah. and they, taking the slow walk down the steps and the slow walk onto the field, you guys were the ones hitting, and I was like, holy crap. <laughs> I better bring it or this show is going to get absolutely embarrassed. <laughs> well, you brought it. And you guys inspired me to get in there and give it everything I had. In the first five swings, I was like, holy crap, should I just walk away right now <laughs> and just call it a day and just say, Robbie and Rex Road, this show right here, you win batting practice. But you guys inspired me because you brought it, and I was like, I've got to do something. I can't embarrass myself or the show. So thank you. you. you oh, you were the star, man. You were. You were the slugger. Well, I don't I was know about out the there star, trying to, but... I was trying to chase down some of those rockets. Yeah. <laughs> I just was thankful that I didn't get hurt. <laughs> that was yes. my biggest goal, that I didn't embarrass myself or get hurt. I felt like I accomplished both, so I felt like that was a huge win. Let, that was a lot of fun. Let's not kid fun. ourselves. Chase McCabe was the star. That's true. Uh, well, uh, yeah. Fair. yeah, that's yeah for different reasons, yes. Yeah. But we, we already knew that. That was already predetermined, yes, Ryan. Was. <laughs> that was like uh, professional wrestling, as Joe Rexford pointed out earlier. <laughs> Predetermined heading into the that program. script was already written. That's right. Darren McFarland <laughs> has been our guest here on Robbie and Rex Show. Darren, appreciate you, brother. Guys, have a great rest of your show. Absolutely. You. We'll continue the discussion on the Predators coming up next. Taking your thoughts on our text line driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com, 615-737-1025, 615-737-1025. And speaking of the text line, 1025 The Game and T-Mobile have teamed up to give away a hockey home gating party. It's time to text the word GAME to 615-737-1025. That's GAME to 615-737-1025. Now to enter for a chance to win a Dos Equis prize pack, which includes a case of beer, dessert from Nothing But Cakes, a T-Mobile prize pack, and food provided by 312 Pizza Company in Germantown. You must be 21 or older 
to enter. We'll be right back here on Robbie and Rex Road, ESPN 102.5 The Game. It's easy to forget that there are people in our community who are starving. Hunger in the United States is at an all-time high due to COVID-19, and people who have never had to wait in line for food have to do so now. People like you and people like me. So help us during this Feeding America Radiothon this Wednesday. You can help by donating at radiocares.org or text RADIO to 662-266, and a donation link will be sent to your phone. Welcome back in. Robbie and Rex Road here on ESPN 102.5 The Game. Robbie Stanley, Joe Rex Road, Ryan Porth here with you on this Monday morning in Nashville, Tennessee. Leading up to the trade deadline today at 2 o'clock in the National Hockey League. Taking your thoughts on our text line driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. 615-737-1025. 615-737-1025. So, Joe, it was an interesting point you brought up with Darren in the last segment. Talking about Granlin and this, you know, Willie in the conversation as well. Is he the guy holding this thing together? We've also got a point like that on our text line as well, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. Shane from Ashland City text in, I can't believe what I'm listening to. The man is holding the team together 
and making plays left and right, and the media is saying trade him for a first or second round pick. This is talking about Granlin. So what do you think of what Shane has thrown out there? Granlin right now holding this group together, and there's no way you could trade him for a first or second round pick. Well, is Shane from Ashland City your burner, your burner <laughs> texter account? Could be. <laughs> Holding it together might be a little overstated. He's playing things. very well. Playing very well. No, I don't know that I would go as far as to say he's holding things together. Like, so last night, it's socially distanced from Bingen. You know, he's way over here. Uh, but at one point, I was like, I mean, look at all the little things that Granlin does for this team, like in every facet of the game. Yeah. Terrific. But, I mean, a first or second round pick, that's that's a pretty valuable commodity. And here's the thing. I think one guy in particular, because I made the point to Willie, okay, well, but what about Forsberg comes back? What about Deshane, Tolvanen? And his point back was, I don't want to take away this. This is going to be a good discussion with those guys later. His point, you know, they don't do all the different things that Granlin does. Okay, you know who can, though? I, I believe can, should, and will when he comes back. We don't know when that'll be. But Matt Deshane, when he comes back, if that's what it is, if they trade Granlin, and now Deshane, here you go, you got your spot back centering that line I would think that like a lot of people on this team that we we've we've had this discussion with John Hines on here a lot of people have talked about it all the stuff that has happened I would think that that would inspire everybody coming back in this lineup to be a little bit more attentive to other things I think so too and I will say I think the skill sets are different sure between Granlin and Duchesne not saying it's the exact same thing right but Deshane can. There needs to be a pep in the step when he comes yeah. back, and, and I, there better be. And I think there. And he knows yeah. the situation, and he knows the expansion drafts coming. You know all that stuff. Yep. He knows the score. So I feel like you've seen this impact. And again, like I personally, we've had the Deshane Johansson argument. I do. I feel like Deshane was doing a lot of what you want him to do before he got hurt, and he was not getting the results. At some point, you got to get the results, but I feel like he was creating a lot, um, and I feel like if he comes back here soon, he can get in there and give you. It's different, but he can still he can compensate to some extent, and maybe and maybe in some ways be a little bit better. But now Johansson's vibing, so that's true. They're in, they're in a much you, better spot than they were. Robbie, sure. Robbie, and Robbie and Ryan vibing. Just vibing. We're vibing, Robbie. That's right. Vibing all day long. At Hall underscore Score five Pittman. goals. Score That's five goals. <laughs> At Hall underscore Pittman on Periscope says, Granlin skates 20 minutes a night, is on power play one, and PK one. He was the only forward on both five-on-three PKs. We might not. He might not be the glue that holds it all together, but, man, that guy does it all. Yeah. He no, does. And from that perspective, the PK – yeah. No, I mean, I'm not saying it's the exact same thing. You're going to lose something you're not going to exactly replace if you move him. But let's take the big take step back a little bit. Take the big view of everything. If it's a first, I don't think you you can't even debate it, right? First, I mean that's that's a heck of a. If it's a first round pick, I don't know how you walk away. If from it's that. a second, I'd do it. If it's a third, mm. I'd think about it. Uh, Mash seven oh nine on YouTube says, "I say the Preds stay put." As a Leafs fan, I'd love Granlund, but they should keep their assets for at least this season. So, the Leafs fan getting Nick Foligno feels better about leaving Granlund to the wayside hey, now. Great. Thanks for weighing in. Absolutely. Preds, you know, stand pat and then lo lose all your expiring contracts, and the Leafs are fine now. Kyle on Periscope says, we need to re-sign Granlund this offseason. I'm sorry. There's nothing to apologize for. Maybe they will. No, listen, that's part of the uh, all the moving parts here, including how soon are guys getting back from injury, what are you offered, and how do you feel about if, – if I if the Preds feel good right now that he, he would want to come back here, like he, he would lean toward coming back here regardless of what the market says, then that's different. That changes it. When we come back, we'll continue the discussion on the National Predators. Taking your thoughts on our text line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com, 615-737-1025, 615-737-1025. Also have an update to the poll question of the day as well, and maybe some news on Jadavion Clowney. All that coming up next. This is Robbie and Rex Road here on ESPN 1025, The Game.
Starting next week, listen to the game every weekday for your chance to win 1000 bucks. It's the game's 1K payday. Listen for the keywords at 9, noon, and 3. And when you hear it, go to thegamenashville.com and enter the keyword for a shot at 1000 bucks. So exciting opportunities coming up next week here on ESPN 1025 The Game. We have a lot of gifts for the people. A lot of gifts for the people coming up. You get to watch our pretty faces now on live streaming. We get gifts for the people coming up. It's a good time. Free Beer Friday. Yeah. It's a good time to be a listener here at ESPN 1025 The Game. The 1K Payday. Yeah. Preds tickets. I'm just kind of sitting here and taking this all in. We've had a lot of people uh, asking about your Virginia Tech shirt or your your hoodie today. Oh, yeah? Drew Chester making fun of it, saying it's from the 1980s. We've had a lot of people asking why you're wearing a Virginia Tech sweatshirt. Go Hokies, baby. I'm a Hokies fan. How long have you had that sweatshirt? My little brother went to Virginia Tech. There you uh, go. He bought me this. I like it's, it. It's not from the 80s. I'm just telling you what people said. It looks like it's from the 80s. It is a little ragged, isn't it? Yeah. Sorry. This is our time to get back at Rex Road for him making fun of my ragged hats like two months ago. Yeah. yeah I see I a like couple it. holes in that sweatshirt. Wow. He's Are there? Taking Are there it holes? It. He's taking it to the next it's level. A, it's a little bit ragged around the neck here. Taking a cigarette and just sticking it through there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, go Hokies, though. Go Hokies, and sorry, Glennon. I hate the Wahoos. That's right. Let's go back to the text line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. Caleb texting in, why would you want to make any moves at all right now? This team is buzzing and playing very well. I wouldn't break anything up. This team, even making the playoffs, is not a bust. Go Preds. There are people that just totally dismiss the idea of a sell of any kind now with the run they've been on. And I understand it. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I understand it. Yeah. I think you're a little bit prisoner of the moment. You're caught up in what's going on, and, and that's fine. I mean, if you think that you know that Granlin selling Granlin off means you are just going to fall apart, which apparently Willie thinks, I think there are re- there are a lot of reasons why you would want to see this through, make the playoffs, business reasons, and also I think there is a little bit of reward the players who have done this for what they've done. Although I think that still has to take a backseat to the you know betterment of the organization. If you can get assets, you've you've sold off assets for a long time. The overall trend is still not the where, where you want it to be going. Maybe it starts coming back because of these young guys. Maybe it does. There's a lot of promise I think with some of the guys who have been out there. But if you have an expiring contract, Porth brought this up last segment. Trade Granlin and then sign then sign him anyway in the off season. You could do that. Yeah. I mean, I get it. Look, it's fun. This team is a blast right now. Twelve of fifteen, and they are just—they are very fun to watch. And it's—it's it's interesting to think about a team last night. Again, what was their fo- shot total? Do you know? Seventeen, eighteen shots. Didn't they have like thirteen with five minutes left in yeah. the third period? Yes, that's they, what I was going to say. They like, ended up, I believe, with twenty. Did they? Okay, I believe. But it, like, I looked up again, said to Vingan, like they have thirteen shots. So a team that has thirteen shots after twenty shots, yes. Okay. Just double check. So after 55 minutes of hockey, they had 13 shots, and they were a blast to watch. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I mean, and that's I mean that's great that they're they are harder to play against. They're they're like the identity is kind of what they talked about being, but they weren't at all for the first two months. Right. My my thing with Granlin too, and it feels like we're just bagging on Granlin, and that's unfortunate because he has been really good. But for the last six years, you've spent the trade deadline day giving up assets to go get players that were either worth it or in most cases not worth it and if you don't do anything today you're essentially giving up an asset to well, go for a, a playoff spot we think i mean maybe we, the offer is not there yeah. right right but we don't I know the offer. i would say you're right yes yeah exactly if you look at it that way but yeah, we don't know the offer we don't know the injury situation people coming back we don't know conversations that may lead David Poyle to believe that Granlin just really wants to be here down the road. We don't know how it's going to go to the expansion draft. A lot of factors. A lot of things we don't know. Yeah, a lot of things. We don't really know anything, <laughs> except that this is an awesome sweatshirt. Let's go back to the text line, driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. Got a texture that says, trade Joey and Philip. Get pieces for the future. This recent run of success is what happened without Philip Forsberg. Let's get a return. They're not trading Philip Forsberg. Trade Joey and Philip. What if that happened today? <laughs> Joe Hansen and Forsberg out the door. He wouldn't be vibing anymore. Uh, Colorado. Yeah. Just give them all your players. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm going to go out on a limb and say that doesn't happen today. Now, Johansson in some form could be elsewhere. Could be. This offseason. Could That's be. That's possible. Yeah, Forsberg's got to be on that do not touch list, right? You would think so. Saying they should as trade well him he should be. just because they have been winning without him is Ooh. way too simplistic. By the way, they were also Ooh. winning with him before he got hurt. Correct. Like this, this did not start when Philip Forsberg went out. That's like he was kind of in the middle of it. That's a take that's on the level of – actually, this could be a good rant. Uh, the, the this amazing college team could beat this pro team, that's yeah. one of my all-time favorites. Like, oh, Bama could crush the Browns. No. They you don't would, think they could they beat the Lions? 60, even the dreadful oh, okay. Lions would just, beat Alabama. There was a, a little, mighty team that will not yield. Yes. <laughs> there was some hesitation there. The Lions would be a heck of a college football team. Yes, they would. <laughs> yes, they would. Dominant. Let's update the poll question at 1025 The Game on Twitter. Preds fans, what do you want to see the team do before today's deadline at 2 o'clock? Do you want to see them sell? Do you want to see them stand pat? Do you want to see them buy? Right now, 45% say stand pat, 42% say sell, and 13% say they would like to see the Predators buy Trolls. at the trade deadline. Trolls, you're lying. I can't. So, so stand pat's going to win. Stand pat's going to win. Looks like it's going to win. That is an up to, upset to me. It's an upset to me, too. Somewhat upsetting, too, but I get it <laughs> to a point. Let's go back to the text line driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. Dan texts in, have you noticed Granlin's time on ice lately? He's too much a cog in the machine now with this thing running. Look, we yes. get it. he's important. He's important. I, I don't think there's any question about that. He's important. He has looked night and day from the time John Hines just took, to, took over here to from Peter Laviolette. I mean, it's it doesn't even look like the same player. Now, granted – he didn't look like the same player coming from Minnesota to here. He looks more like the player he was in Minnesota now that he's here under John Hines. Well, the thing that I didn't realize, and if you know, obviously you, you're gonna have that Fiala Granlin thing that is not gonna be close unless they keep Granlin. But right. I didn't realize he was so good at things like the penalty kill. Yeah. You know, I mean, offensively, obviously it didn't go well, especially under Laviolette. But I did not realize he was such a solid all-around player as he is he's essential like basically in every facet so i get it it's a big loss i don't know that he's the linchpin of the whole thing it'd be a big loss christopher on periscope says are we perhaps overhyping the predators the majority of the opponents have been the wings the hawks the blue jackets and the stars they've barely played against the canes lightning and panthers in this stretch yeah that's fair too now i thought that they played a winning level of hockey game against Tampa Bay Saturday and they still lost three nothing um but that's fair too I mean they're done with Detroit they got three straight against Chicago this could certainly still turn the other way on them and 960 or right about right thereabouts for uh Soros in this stretch that's not even if he's even if he's you know you're starting goalie he's really good he's taking it to another level he's not 960 no He's not going to be 960. That would be a record. Yeah, that would be a re- some kind of a record or <laughs> yes. something. Yeah. Yes, would. Ten of their last 12 wins have come against Dallas, Chicago, or Detroit. Yep. And again, like to me, Dallas, Chicago, those are reputable wins. Absolutely. So yeah. take, take the dead things out of there. I'm sorry to rip on all the Detroit teams. And look, no matter what happens this week against Tampa and then the two road games in Carolina, next week the three-game set against Chicago. I mean, that could be your season in terms of – the postseason. So yeah. if, you, you know, if you're looking at this today and it's like, look, it's really important across the whole organization, it's really important to make the playoffs. And if you know and you're David Poyle, yeah, those guys aren't going to be back for Chicago. Forsberg, Tolvanen, whoever, DeShane. You know, so it's going to be like a little bit too much of a young replacement-filled lineup and no Granlin. I mean, it has, that has to be a factor. If you don't get a first round pick as an offer, yeah. So who's uh, of the of the deadline as a whole? Who's the top guy that's left? I mean, Felino is gone. Taylor Hall is gone. David Savard's gone on defense. Like who's left out there that's a top target? If you're a team around the league looking to buy, like is Granlin the guy at forward? Is is he the best one left? Now we don't know what the future looks like for a guy like Ryan Getzlaff. There's a guy in St. Louis is interesting to me because Mike Hoffman 
It's not worked out well lately, and he was a healthy scratch for a period. And St. Louis has started to play a lot better as of late over the course of the last three or four games. Do they have a place for Mike Hoffman? Does he stay there? Like, there's been some chatter about maybe them selling him off and moving on from him. Like, I, I, there's going to be some interesting names floated out there today that I, I'm interested to see what happens there. You didn't mention Ricard Matthias. Raquel in Anaheim as well. Pretty good player. You didn't mention Matias Eckel. I did He's not. Still mention on the big Eckel. board. He's still on the big board. Yeah, he is. I'd be surprised at this point. That'd be stunning. Would it? We've gone from uh, that likely to happen to now stunning. I agree. I think it would be. Be stunning in that room too. Yeah. yeah like would. like if Granlin gets traded today. Look, obviously, I think there'll be some people who are upset in the room, but also. Everybody knows how this works, especially with expiring contracts. If you were to sell a foundational player like Ekholm today, I think that would be very surprising. That would be a, a kick in the gut for some people. I think it would be as well. We'll continue to keep you updated all day long here on ESPN 102.5 The Game with the trade deadline coming at 2 p.m. Central Time today here in the National Hockey League. When we come back, some NFL news to get into. Jadavion Clowney looks like he could be on the verge of finding a new home. And there was also an atrocious call last night in Major League Baseball that really has you asking the question, like, what are umpires and officials looking at in today's world of sports? We'll talk about all that coming up next. This is Robbie and Rex Road here on ESPN 1025 The Game.
Welcome back in. Final segment of the day here on Robbie and Rex Road, ESPN 1025 The Game, streaming live on Periscope, on YouTube, and on Twitch as well. Joe Rex Road, Lang Dixon on Twitter said, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the 80s retro. So if that was an 80s retro shirt from Virginia Tech, nothing wrong with it. Oh, I totally agree. Now, if it were the 80s, this sweatshirt, it would be like a nighty for me. You know, yes. <laughs> about 150 pounds lighter, but yeah. <laughs> Something like that. I don't oh, think it's quite that right. much. No. Yeah, actually. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Graduating from high school to today, I'm 85 pounds heavier. Okay. There's a big – That's. I mean, it's a big difference between 150. Yeah, man, that's true. Yeah. What about – I was a that? very small child for some of these. Yes. What about I'm that? I'm very young. You are. That photo, circa 2000. Yeah. That we've tweeted out before. This, this would have been a billowy – yeah, this would have – yeah. I mean, that was like, what would that have been? My gosh, that was. Did you, you say look, that was some Lansing newspaper joint or something? You look svelte. Well, that was the Lansing yeah. State Journal. Yeah, that was one. That was my headshot at the Lansing State Journal That's 20 right. years ago, and it was many, many pounds ago. Joseph, this is a sad day here on the program. It looks like uh, Jadavion Clowney's time with the Tennessee Titans could officially be coming to an end. The Cleveland Browns progressing in talks on a deal with Jadavion Clowney, according to to Diana Russini from ESPN, and it looks like a deal could be completed soon. Clowney visited with the Browns last month and uh, apparently is visiting with them again this week. Your reaction to Jadavion Clowney potentially signing with the Cleveland Browns? It was always the Browns. It was always the Browns, finally, you know? Joe's Clowney. Yeah, Joe's Clowney. I will miss you, Jadavion, but I, I want to find this Twitter account that, like, Titans media people have been tweeting for weeks that is saying, oh, it's done deal. Like, why anybody thought the Titans were going to, like, re-sign Clowney as their three? Makes no sense. Just, yeah. <laughs> so, this per well, whoever's Twitter account this is, need to bring it out, and, and that person needs to be shamed. Is it Heidi from Dixon? Could I don't be. know. It could be. Yeah, what's Heidi going to do now? If Clowney ends up in Cleveland, the material is going to dry up around here. It's not going to be your Clowney anymore. Oh, she'll make fun of me for other <laughs> okay. things. Plus, Howdy has... Howdy. <laughs> Howdy, Heidi. Heidi has four ladders. That's true. Gosh, you got me all flustered, Heidi. Uh, man. Yeah, so uh, – I wonder how much money great. they're going to give Clowney. That's my thing. Like, they, they tried to sign him to a multi-year deal last year at around $18 million. Like, where does Clowney's contract come in? I'm fascinated to see what that looks yeah, like. Yeah, me too. I mean, it's got to be – Does it's it? It's got to be so – incentive laden doesn't yeah. it oh, just yeah. based on yeah. participation i mean it's yeah i can't wait to see i can't either so we'll see what happens on that front it looks like jadavion Clowney progressing closer and closer to a deal with the cleveland Browns. so miles garrett on one side jadavion Clowney on the other side watch him stay healthy and have like nine and a half sacks right for the just wreck games <laughs> just left and right people. yeah Joe, did you see this last night in Major League Baseball? It's a game, and this was all over Twitter in the middle of the Preds game last night. The Braves and the Phillies. The Phillies end up winning 7-6 to six, coming from behind. But the story in the game was a call at home plate for the Phillies. Now, he was originally called safe. I believe this was Alec Bohm. Alec Baum? How do you say his name, Porth? I think it's Bohm. Alex, oh, so I had it right the first time. Alec Bohm sliding home on the eventual winning run as Travis Darno for the Braves applies the tag, he gets his knee in front of the plate, blocks the plate, and I will admit, at first glance, it looked like he was safe. Like in live action, it looks like he's safe, but that's what replay's for. You go to the replay, you check it out, and there, a plate umpire Lance Barrett, he called him safe. And there were at least two camera angles that I think clearly showed that he was out and did not touch home plate. He never touched the plate. And should have been, thro should have been called out. Like it was pretty cut and dry. But the replay comes and goes. They come back. They call him safe. Nothing gets changed. I don't know what they're looking at. Like, I was blown away that you go back, you look at that on replay, and you come back with, you still think that he's safe at home? Like, I guess they thought maybe, like, his big toe or something makes contact with the, with the plate. It was an atrocious, atrocious call last night. Like, if you're going to go to replay, apply the replay. Like, what are you looking at? It's like, and, and so then people respond to stuff like this and say, we got to get rid of replay. Well, 
No. It, it, seriously, imagine. Like, imagine if we didn't have replay, right, in, in sports. Like, fo- how many touchdowns that are called touchdowns before that uh, clearly aren't? Yeah. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube, but it's infuriating uh, that y- you have people whose job is just to look at something that we can all see, and then they don't see the same thing. Like, how? How does this happen? It's like the Preds penalty. I know that's subjective compared with this, but, like, I'm still am mad about that from last week. If you want to go back, since I'm wearing a Virginia Tech sweatshirt, sorry, Glennon, hope you're listening. I mean, that ridiculous call in the national championship game two years ago yeah. where he knocks the ball out of the guy's hand. Great. We saw what happened. Oh, let's slow it down to see if it touched a fingernail on the way out. Ridiculous. But ridiculous. It's just part. There's no but. No. Our friend Drew Chester te- texts in on my text line. Also says, the Braves was an atrocious call. The Reds had a homer that hit a chair and bounced back in on Friday, called a ground rule double, and they even went to replay on it and still got it wrong on the play. So, I mean, that one's a little bit different. Sometimes umpire discretion on the ball going over the fence, whether or not fan interference is involved, like that could be a little different. But uh, the, one la- the one last night was much worse. Yeah. Especially given the situation because the Phillies won the game because of that. Yeah. 7-6 to six final. I just don't know how you look at the replay and determine that he was – like sometimes – and I feel like this is a problem in baseball more so than in other sports. Umpires are stubborn. And, like, they, they want their call to be right. And, I, look, I think it's ridiculous in baseball anyway that you can just toss players for the heck of tossing players anyway. Like, have some thick skin. You're getting paid to umpire a sport. Like, unless somebody's chasing you with a bat or just cussing you out left and right up and down the field – Deal with it. Chasing people, you with a bat. Yeah, like people are, are they're coming to watch That's the players. That's ejectable. Yeah, you can, you can eject somebody for that. <laughs> they're coming to watch the players play. They're not coming to watch the umpires put on a show. And too often, I think umpires put on a show in Major League Baseball. So I've got a problem with that anyway. But it feels like they are like looking for reasons to be right. Like, oh, I made the call. I've got to be right. And that's ridiculous. Just look at the play. It's obvious. Change the call. It's no big deal. You missed it in real time. It happens. Change the call. I'd say that was a Rob rant. What do you think? A little bit. A little bit of a Rob we had rant. The Rex rant at yeah. seven forty-five, and we have a Rob rant at nine forty-five. Hey, maybe that's how we'll maybe we should every maybe time. we should do it that way. Yeah, well, maybe so. One of the funny things, though, about that last night was when uh, obviously when they upheld the call, the Braves bench lost their ever-loving minds. Oh yeah, which they should have. And Brian Snicker came out to argue it, and it was humorous because he's got his mask on and he keeps. He pulls it down, and then he tries to pull it back up, and then it's almost like covering his eyes. Yeah. And then he is like, he, he can't get his mask right, and he's just losing his mind yeah. as he's great. trying to adjust his mask. It was, it was pretty funny. Like I'm sure Kim, Bryce like fans the, didn't think it was funny. Like no. the Kim Mulkey mask yeah. Yeah, zoom. Ooh. Yeah, that was something. <laughs> Let's go back to the text line driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. Keith texted in. Now, I told you about this earlier. In the Rex Rant segment, Keith's idea was Rex Pose. Which, again, a lot of you can do with your last name. This one to walk off with Jadavion Clowney, now potentially headed to the Cleveland Browns. Keith says, Joe Davy gone. <laughs> uh, Keith is great at this. Keep him coming, Keith. I'll nice take the Keith nicknames. is great with that joke. Yeah, he is. Joe Davy Joe gone. Davy gone. And Rex Bose. Yes. Keith bringing it. Keith is bringing the noise today. Didn't Keith come up with Rex Croak? Oh, yeah. I don't I don't want Rex Croak anymore after what Yarn Croak did in the shootout. Don't, don't. Don't do that slow down stuff. Man. Yeah, skate with some speed. Been hanging out around shot. Johansson too long. <laughs> Yarncroke's vibing, baby. Come on, vibing. Everybody's vibing. Figure eights. That does it for us today here on Robbie and Rex Road. We'll keep you updated all day long here on 1025 The Game on the NHL trade deadline. Darren Donica Chase coming up next. This is ESPN 1025 The Game. We're vibing, Robbie.